University Professor of Communication Engineering. He served in various academic and administrative capacities, culminating in his appointment as the fifth and immediate past Vice Chancellor of Covenant University. His progressive academia leadership experience in developing teams and collaborating regionally and internationally to maintain the competitive edge propelled Covenant University to the top of the Times Higher Education World University rankings in Nigeria under his watch. He is recognized for contemporary multidisciplinary academic research across wireless and mobile communications, internet of things and smart cities. Professor Atairo is a member of the ICT and digital economy thematic group of the TED Fund Research and Development Standing Committee. And he was recently appointed as NREN ambassador by the board of WACREN. He is a distinguished fellow and member of various professional bodies. So um, thank you, Professor Tayero, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Owen. Uh, let me start by appreciating the organizers of the symposium for bringing up such a, an interesting topic as a national open science, uh, which is very, very germane in the, the world we live in today, where information, as we all know, must be shared freely and openly so that we can uh, leapfrog, especially for those of us here in the global south, uh, the things that have been done in the global north. And uh, while doing that, not jettison our own uh, peculiarities as uh, a community. Uh, thank you, Owen, for giving the house rules. I believe that was well taken. So we just go straight into the presentations of the day. And like uh, Owen rightly mentioned, whenever we have the presence of the executive secretary, of uh, TED Fund, that's a uh, Professor Suleiman Elias Bogoro, who just let me briefly to give his own opening remarks. I believe uh, Dr. Popola will appraise us of that whenever it's possible. So the first presentation we'll be having will be from uh, Dr. Hannah Persik. I hope I spell, uh, pronounced that right, Hannah. Yes, good morning. She is, Excellent good day. morning. Yeah. She is a senior program specialist at UNESCO. And she'll be talking to us on uh, UNESCO recommendations for open science. Anna has been the acting chief of science policy and partnership section at the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, France since 2018. By training, she is an ecologist and uh, has a PhD in ecotoxicology at the University of Paris South. And that's in the south of France. Dr. Hannah Persic joined UNESCO in April of 2006 as a program specialist serving the UNESCO's Man and the Biosphere Program within the Division of the Ecological and Health Sciences. She has then served as science specialist at the UNESCO liaison office in New York. That's between 2011 and 2018. Our work relates to strengthening the science policy interface and the promotion of science technology and innovation in the implementation of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals as the SDGs. She is currently coordinating the development of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. So no, no other person could have done justice to this topic on recommendations of open science than Dr. Anna Persik. Anna, thank you for joining us. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be uh, with you today and also to listen into your discussions uh, on open science initiatives and action plan 
at the national level for Nigeria. So it, again, very good to be here. I'm gonna do a little presentation uh, about the UNESCO recommendation on open science, uh, where it comes from, what it is, and where we are in the process, and then how it relates possibly to the discussion that you are having here today. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen for a PowerPoint presentation. And I hope you can hear, you can see it well. Here we go. Do you see it uh, all right? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. So um, I just wanted to start a little bit by saying that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are all living today um, in a way it was um, a, a, a huge reminder about the importance of science, technology, innovation, but more than that, about the importance of timely and free access to scientific data, publication, and information. It also raised awareness about the importance of scientific collaborations and sharing of information at different levels, from individual level to institutional level, national level, regional level, and international level. Um, it also highlighted the need for um, a better science policy society dialogue and exchanges uh, between the different um, actors in the society. Uh, and then, of course, and that is important in particular from the United Nations point of view, is that this COVID-19 really showed us how important the human right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress uh, is for uh, each and every citizen and each and every person in the world. And in this context, um, of course, we've seen uh, a rise of the importance of science. Um, uh, I, I can hear an echo, so I wonder if you can hear me still, you can still hear me well, no, it's fine now. Uh, and we do see that there is a huge potential in open science to not only increase the quality of science, but to make the entire scientific process more transparent, more collaborative, and more inclusive. So we're not talking only about the fact of having access to data or to publications. We really are talking about the entire um, process of making science that can be more open, that can be more inclusive, and that can include actors that are uh, not usually included in the traditional um, science systems. Um, of course, open science, from our point of view, can also be a true game changer to bridge the science, technology, and innovation gaps, and this is what we've heard in the opening of this meeting. Uh, and to fulfill the human right to science. So I think from the UNESCO perspective, these two objectives uh, are extremely important when we talk about the implementation of open science, making sure that open science is a tool to bridge the existing gaps in science, technology, innovation, and uh, a way of fulfilling the human right to science. And we see it increasingly as an accelerator for the implementation of sustainable development goals, because indeed we do know that science technology innovation uh, is critical for the achievement of all the sustainable development goals. So uh, more equitable uh, uh, and universal access to scientific information certainly uh, can uh, increase the, the, the pace of implementation of the SDGs. However, we've seen also that there is a lot of different um, uh, frameworks, action plans, policies on open science being done at different uh, levels. And we don't have for the moment any international policy framework on open science. Uh, we do not have a common definition of open science, a shared set of values and principles and a shared set of actions. And that's why UNESCO uh, at its last general conference, so where all the member states met in November 2019, they decided to task the organization to develop such an, uh, an instrument, a recommendation of UNESCO on open science, precisely to have this uh, international policy framework on open science that is currently missing. So when we talk about the when we talk about the uh, a UNESCO recommendation, it is a policy instrument. Um, it is a, a soft law tool, so it is not imposed on the countries that adopt it, but it does serve um, as a, as a, as a legal framework on a certain issue. In this case, uh, for open science, and 
it is hoped that the countries that adopt uh, this recommendation will be changing some of their um, the way that they are doing uh, and moving forward with uh, open science in the way that has been um, kind of presented in the in the recommendation. So to build up this uh, recommendation on open science, which, as I said, is a global uh, international policy framework for open science policy and an action framework for open science. Uh, we went through a very extent, extensive uh, consultative process since uh, December 2019 until uh, just a few months ago, basically. Um, this process was guided by an international open science advisory committee, and I think that we have some members of that advisory committee even present in this meeting. Um, it was supported by a global open science partnership. We did uh, an online consultation, uh, a survey, which was distributed as much as possible to different stakeholders in different countries, and we received almost 3,000 inputs from over 130 countries. We've held a series of regional consultations in Africa, Arab states, Latin America, Asian Pacific, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, North America, across, across the world. Um, we've had also these thematic and multi-stakeholder uh, consultations, and we received inputs really from all the stakeholders, young scientists, academies, uh, libraries, uh, UN system, indigenous peoples. Uh, we really tried as much as possible to gather feedback and inputs into the recommendation from um, all the different stakeholders. Uh, once we had the first uh, draft of the recommendation, the first draft text of the recommendation, uh, that text was um, uh, then, um, uh, let's say, um, discussed by an intergovernmental meeting, which took place in May. So different governments, and it was, I think, over 100 uh, countries that were represented, had their representatives, uh, and they were discussing uh, the text of the recommendation. And in the end, we actually had a consensus on a draft recommendation text um, that will now be um, sent to the general conference or submitted to the general conference, which is meeting in November this year. Uh, where the member states of UNESCO are expected and are hoped to adopt the recommendation. So it was a really, really interesting process. We've learned a lot uh, throughout the process. We saw that there is still a lot of uh, different ways in which different actors and different stakeholders and different countries or regions perceive open science and the different elements of open science. But I think what was really important is that more than that, we saw that there are synergies in the way the different countries uh, see open science really as a tool for moving development uh, and human uh, well-being. So the, the recommendation, the draft recommendation text as it stands now, uh, and maybe we can, I can also share it with you in the, in the chat, um, it, it has this common definition, it has uh, a series of uh, values and principles, and then a set of actions, uh, basically, for the different actors, governments principally, but then also other actors. In terms of the, um, the definition, um, the definition is really that uh, open science is, is like a, a movement and uh, um, that increases scientific collaborations and sharing of information for the benefits of science and society, makes scientific knowledge openly available, accessible and reusable for everyone, opens the process of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation and communication to societal actors beyond the traditional scientific community. So the important part here is to say it is, of course, about um, opening the access to scientific information, but more than that, it really is to open science to uh, collaborations and also to um, societal actors beyond the traditional science community. In terms of the key pillars of uh, open science, uh, the way it is defined now in the recommendation is that we have the open scientific knowledge uh, that brings together open access to scientific publications, open research data, open educational resources, open source software and source code, and open hardware. 
Then uh, we have open science infrastructures, both virtual and physical infrastructures. Um, open engagement of societal actors through crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, uh, scientific volunteering, citizen and participatory science, and also the uh, open dialogue with other knowledge systems, in particular with um, indigenous knowledge holders, marginalized scholars, and also uh, local communities. So it, it really is a comprehensive uh, concept um that has different pillars and and and, and different elements um, into it and different actors that have to be consulted and engage in the in the process with of course the scientific community at the center of that process uh, we as i said the recommendation also um, spells out the key values and principles the shared values and principles quality and integrity, collective benefit, equity and fairness, and diversity and inclusiveness, which are the key values. And then uh, on the other side, you have the different principles um, that need to be applied uh, for open science, transparency, scrutiny, equality of opportunities, responsibility, collaboration, flexibility, sustainability. So all of these uh, notions are explained in the, uh, in the recommendation so that we are really sure that we are all talking about the same thing and that we are all um, uh, thinking about the same, uh, uh, the, the same way that open science uh, needs to operate. In terms of the different areas of action, and I think that's uh, kind of the, a very important, of course, part of the, the recommendation, uh, we have seven areas of action, uh, promoting a common understanding of open science, enabling policy environment, investing in infrastructures and services, investing in human resources, promoting co international cooperation, promoting innovative approaches, and fostering more broadly a general culture of uh, open science. So under each and every of these um, areas of action, there is a series of specific actions that the government uh, and different science actors, are, open science actors, are supposed to um, um, implement uh, in doing our open science. Um, in terms of the next steps for the recommendation, so you see here the whole timeline uh, since um, uh, January 2020, but now we are already uh, in, in September 2021, and we are actually now, we have just submitted uh, the draft text of the recommendation to the General Conference, that's the governing body of UNESCO, where 193 member states of UNESCO come together and make decisions. And so they will go through the final text of the recommendation and uh, adopt it, we hope. Uh, and once it's adopted uh, by the member states, we start with the, uh, with the implementation. And I think a very important part of the implementation will be um, um, workshops or seminars like this one and on the national level uh, where people and the different stakeholders from the national level will be able um, to have a look a little bit and map the open science ecosystem in their countries and see what is needed uh, to align open science system in their country with uh, the UNESCO uh, recommendation. So we know that there is still a lot of challenges in different countries, in different regions. Uh, not all the countries and not all the actors are at the same level. Not all the elements of open science either uh, are at the same level. So it's, it, it will have to be a, a, a transition to this new way of, of doing science. But the most important thing will really be to try to shift from the spirit of competition to the spirit of collaboration, uh, to seeing science as a product, uh, to, to, to shift from seeing science as a product to, to really seeing science as a process uh, that has outputs, but the, the entire process is, is very important as well, particularly if we also want to build trust between the scientific community and um, uh, uh, and uh, local communities, citizens, um, and uh, the, the broader audience. And then it is important that really open science, with open science, we ensure that it is science for all and not uh, science for a selected few. So I think what is really important with the open science movement um, 
globally is to make sure that the mistakes that were made in the past with the traditionally closed science systems are not uh, done again and that um, open science really serves to close the gaps between uh, developed and developing countries in science technology um, and innovation and that, that it does not uh, further open them up. So um, I think I'm going to stop here and thank you for your patience and for listening. Uh, and I'll be happy to respond to any of your questions um, later on in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Anna, for such a wonderful presentation. I'm sure everybody is appreciative of the information you've just given us. Uh, one of the key takeaway there is that uh, one of your very last slides when you say we start seeing science not as a competition, but as collaboration. I believe that's very, very important in moving from the paradigm of closed science, if you will, to open science that we're trying to evolve now. I'm sure the questions will come in the Q&A and we'll be harvesting them for that time. We will go swiftly now to the next presentation. It's supposed to be from Professor. No, that will be from uh, Homo Hoyer, talking about LipSense, an African framework for sustainable open Actually. science. Actually, I think before Omar joins us, uh, Prof, I think uh, Suleiman uh, Sunusi is going to be representing Professor Galadanchi. I see, because I didn't see him on the, yes. Yes, on my the list. Okay, so we take uh, the representative of Prof Galadanchi then to make the presentation. Well, since we have the profile for Prof Galadanchi, I will just read it all the same and uh, his representative will now make the presentation. Prof Galadanchi was supposed to speak on open research and imperative for higher education. Uh, he is a computer engineer who has very broad experience in the high cities in general and uh, in software engineering and telecommunications in particular. Uh, he got his BSc degree in electrical computer engineering with first class honors from King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia. That was in 1984. He thereafter obtained a master's and PhD degree from Boston University in USA in 87 and 94 respectively. He currently teaches at the Department of Software Engineering at Bayero University Kano as an associate professor. He is also the director of the Center for Information Technology of the university. He served as special advisor to the governor on ICT education and uh, later as a commissioner for science and technology for Kano State. He has chaired many high level committees at the state and federal levels in Nigeria. And I know personally that he's the chair for the ICT and uh, digital economy thematic subgroup of uh, Tet Fund Research and Development Standing Committee. So with that, we'll have the representative of uh, Professor Galadanshi make the presentation. Uh, Suleiman Bashir Sanusi, you have the floor. Okay, uh, good morning all. Uh, let me share my screen. Once again, good morning all. Uh, I'll be making a presentation uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Bashir Kaladinchi uh, on the imperative for Nigerian higher education. So just like the last speaker, I've given an overview of uh, what 
uh, the open research entails. Uh, we just let me shed a little bit uh, more light from uh, the professor's uh, presentation. Uh, well, those of us, uh, particularly in the ICT industry, are very fortunate to have the concept of uh, open source software, you know, open up opportunities for us to be able to, you know, get very vital skills that otherwise wouldn't have been readily available because the alternative would have been uh, very expensive. Now, likewise, those of us also in research, the concept of having uh, open research, particularly for uh, those of us, you know, in the developing world, uh, brings much hope and uh, excitement at the same time. Now, one of the key areas to, to look at is the fact that uh, the established, you know, publishing uh, renowned publishing journals are warming up to this idea. You know, that also means that uh, just like when you take a uh, uh, leaf from the case with the open source movement, where today you find most of uh, the top names in the ICT industry, in the software industry, uh, already creating or opening up some aspects of you know their projects uh, to open source because it has become an inevitable uh, inevitable uh, force to be reckoned with, and that uh, a lot of you know major projects defined today uh, have their source from uh, open source. So the the view you know of uh, open research in this uh, sense, uh, in the sense that uh, you are allowed, you know, to collaborate, you know, in a more open manner and uh, without spending as much, you know, and yet also have the ability to determine how your work is being used is quite exciting for uh, researchers uh, worldwide. So this, you know, for us uh, makes or uh, points as one of the most important of uh, open research. Uh, the fact that, you know, with little funding, we can actually achieve what, you know, uh, our peers uh, will spend a lot of money in achieving. And uh, we will be able to actually progress in this particular uh, endeavor of ours. So the state of high uh, research in our high institutions, you know, in the immediate past, you know, the, those of us who have been around in this industry uh, for some time will know that, you know, the focus before now has always been about teaching. As very little has been said or very little energy has been expended on research. Of course, apart from the research that naturally or traditionally will come from uh, supervision of postgraduate students, you know, and uh, other than that, you know, very little has been done in that direction. Of course, until the advent of, you know, TED Fund, which has made available, you know, uh, various programs to support uh, research in the industry. So there, there's one of the things that's also missing is, you know, the triple heritage of, you know, having universities, government, and the industry collaborate to come up with both a policy and a product, uh, such as you will find in the developed world. And uh, on, well, on, on the part of the institutions uh, themselves, you find very little indigenous research, you know, because 
even those of uh, researchers, those of the researchers that actually have made spirited effort in making you know, their research uh, have actually either run out of funds or run out of political will or support to uh, enable such research see the light of day. And most of the research also taking place in our university really lack uh, you know, economic impact. You know, what we find is that we're doing research for the purpose of either you know, uh, progression in the academic area or as a result, you know, requirement for their programs. Then third fund, you know, appeared on the scene. So a few years ago, uh, third fund introduced, you know, various interventions targeting research and researchers uh, across you know both the universities the polytechnics and uh, this has actually invigorated you know the entire uh, sector such that uh, now you find a lot more people you know either collaborating interdisciplinary co uh, collaborations are now more evident within the university space and uh, the one of the first things the third fund did in, in this uh, respect was, you know, to, to aid the universities in establishing research and innovative or innovation directories. Now, these innovative directories, uh, sole responsibility within the universities is to support, you know, and guide uh researchers and researchers in order to either bring them uh in line with uh, the requirement for uh, funding or to support them you know generally in achieving uh their research uh goals other than that tedfall also introduced institution-based research grants in which case uh researcher uh, within the higher educational uh, space is able to apply to the fund for research based on any uh, discipline. Now, this research was uh, um, targeted at, you know, mid to low level, you know, uh, research, research that required for, uh, not so much funding. And uh, the maximum, you know, grant that is available from this particular research uh, uh, program, it's about 2 million. Now, depending on what uh, the research is about or what the scope of the research is about, uh, two million go a long way in achieving a lot of this low-level uh, research. Then there was also uh, the National Research Fund, which uh, this has been uh, in the pipeline for almost about uh, eight to nine years now, where these targeted a lot more robust, you know, uh, researchers. And uh, a lot of um, collaboration is also encouraged in this uh, space. Now, one of the, the, the highlight of this particular research is the fact that uh, funding, unlike the institutional-based research, funding can reach up to a maximum of 40 million. And now this, of course, will enable researchers across the university or the high institution space to be able to compete favorably, uh, you know, on delivering uh, researches that will either both help the, the economy of the country or the world entirely. Then there's also an effort currently ongoing uh, of creating a National Research Development Foundation uh, this will create a research policy for the entire country. 
Now, of course, for this to happen, since it's a national uh, policy, a lot of uh, legislative uh, work also has to be done. Now, this is already ongoing, you know, at the background before at the end of the day, what we expect is we're going to have a, a law, you know, passed in the National Assembly that will give the legal backing to the creation of this development foundation. Uh, hello. Yes, please. Yes, Professor Bogoro speaking. I'm hooked on. I just had some network problem. I'm on now. Okay. Okay, Prof. At the end of uh, Suleiman's presentation, we'll introduce you, sir. This is great. Thank Welcome, you. Sir. You're welcome, yeah. sir. Thank you. I, uh, I, had, I had a uh, an appointment challenge here. Okay, okay, please. Thank you. You're Suleiman. welcome. Sir. I came on medical, so I had an appointment with a doctor. Sorry, we just had to finish that bit. I'm sorry. So, Suleiman, if you want to continue. Okay. Okay. So, keen into the open research uh, movement. Now, while you could argue that uh, we've been, you know, late to come into uh, research generally, but open research particularly has an advantage for us latecomers because even if we've been in, within this space earlier on, uh, funding will have been a major issue. But thanks, of course, to Ted Fund, this is also being tackled. And the fact that, uh, you know, the, the advantages of open research uh, particularly suits our own uh, needs at this stage of our own development. So it's imperative for us to actually key in, you know, as a nation uh, into open research because of the various uh, obvious advantages uh, that it offers. Now, of course, uh, one of the problems a lot of researchers, uh, also a lot of the problems uh, our researchers face, uh, you know, barriers, uh, I will include, you know, at the end of researches, uh, do we have a commercializable product? With open research, this makes that part smoother and easier. So what are the necessary steps uh, to achieve uh, this goal? So the first one is to formulate, of course, a strong national policy on open research that will promote uh, it in its all ramification and also provide you know, a sustainable uh, framework for its implementation. Uh, build a culture among Nigerian researchers and institutions for open research, you know, through strong advocacy and sensitization. Create an en enabling environment that will promote open research. Build a robust infrastructure that will support open research. In particular, uh, this would be uh, institutional uh, research and educational networks and uh, stronger national research and educational uh, networks. It should be said that uh, we already have uh, NGUN and it's doing a lot within the applicable space, but uh, a lot more needed to be done. So there's also the uh, collaboration among researchers, you know, by creating platform for exchange and sharing of ideas, you know, that is at the national level. You could also argue that uh, historically we've always had, you know, journals that are institutional based or nationally based, but most of these journals were actually implemented, you know, with uh, those ones we're trying to move away from, that is the proprietary uh, journals, where, you know, a lot of uh, money has to be spent in order to, to have works published. So there is also the need to publish, uh, sorry, to promote uh, centers of excellence in different institutions so that they can have superior equipment and expertise in specific areas such that facilities 
uh, can serve as common resources for use by all researchers. Then we should also, lastly, uh, sorry, uh, we should also discourage exploitative or proprietary practice that are only beneficial to a few businessmen. Uh, even though at the end of the uh, one will argue, you know, most researchers will also want something back, you know, for the effort put in. But of course, if you look at uh, open research, you see you can also get those same advantages while benefiting, you know, the larger, you know, body of knowledge. Then we should come up with innovative ideas on how to promote open research. Uh, then lastly, get funding sources that are in line with uh, open research. It should be added that uh, some funding, uh, international funding, uh, specifically for open research, uh, you know, coming up, and that uh, you know, projects that are or researches that are open are particularly suited for these particular types of uh, uh, research uh, fundings. So, in conclusion, open research is excellent for the development, uh, developing world, and for the globe as a whole. Though Nigeria has been slow to embrace research in its high institution, but it's quickly warming up thanks to the enormous support from Tech Fund. Uh, Nigerian high institutions are in good position to benefit from enormous opportunities that open research offers. However, it might take certain steps that will promote those research in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh very detailed presentation and uh, not only making conjectures but giving very strong recommendations on how open research can be incorporated into the things we're doing uh, in Nigeria higher education system and specifically into the efforts that uh, the TED fund uh, is spearheading currently. And uh, what a good thing that we have the he heads of the TED fund with us now, Professor Elias Suleiman Bogoro, you're most welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good work you're doing at the Harold HSC level. We appreciate you. And while that uh, presentation was going on, I noticed that uh, Professor Gala Danshi also joined us. He's currently here now. And I'm sure he'll be around for the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to note that this is a well attended uh, symposium. We have over about 80 participants currently online. And uh, that, that speaks to the urgency of what we're discussing right now. Uh, having the privilege of the presence of the years of uh, TED Fund, uh, let me quickly read his uh, profile while he gives his welcome remark. Professor Bogoro. Suleiman Elias served as the executive secretary of uh, TED Fund from 2014 to 2016. And uh, because of the good work he did during that tenure, he was reappointed in 2019. He commenced his academic career at the Federal University of Technology, uh, renamed Abubakar Tafawa Balewa uh, HTBU University Bauchi as a pioneer graduate assistant in the school of agriculture in 1984, where he rose to the rank of professor of animal science. Professor Bogoro is a member of several professional bodies, including the Nigerian Institute of Animal Science, the Nigerian Society of Animal Production, Animal Science Association of Nigeria, British Society of Animal Science. He is a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences, FAS, since 2018. He is a distinguished animal scientist, the highest honor in the animal science profession in Nigeria. Professor Sullivan Elias Bogoro was nicknamed the Apostle of Research and Development, one of the loudest voices conversing for the establishment of a national R&D foundation that will become the common platform for researchers and industry private sector. Prof, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much. Um, I want to appreciate you guys for putting up this platform, Open Research. Um, Dr. Ayo uh, Mustafa Kukwala, who, uh, who is my technical assistant in charge of R&D, has kept me updated on the, the activities and operations of this platform. And I'm very happy to join you today. Uh, I think it's only right, I should apologize for coming on late. Uh, I am in London on a private visit in respect of my health, it's just a follow-up, you know, medical check. In fact, uh, my coming on late, I thought after we sorted out the technology, there was uh, a phone call from the secretary of the consultant I'm to me. And I could not miss that. I'm so sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I listened to the, the last uh, person that made the presentation. And I want to appreciate this platform for acknowledging those things that we have been doing in Tech Fund. Uh, for me, the institutionalization of R&D is an inescapable imperative. If our nation wants to be on the same page with the most competitive economies and technologies and indeed nations across the world in the 21st century, because it is knowledge that drives competitiveness, that defines it. And more specifically, research is the nerve center of knowledge. It develops, generates, and perfects knowledge that is communicated through teaching. And it's the same outcome of knowledge that is applied for community development. Uh, remember that the university lecturer is known for three things, being a teacher, being a researcher, and getting involved in community development. Uh, for me, when I came in 2014, in Tedfan, I realized for quite some years, I had reflected over a major weakness in the Nigerian university system. And if we know, as a matter of fact, that universities are traditionally the leaders of research, and suddenly we notice that um, particularly post-colonial, if I even pre-colonial, um, the emphasis were always around uh, teaching for the purpose of producing persons that will go out there to take over from the colonial masters. Uh, research was much less a priority. And that has continued very sadly. And I thought, it's a major error. The most competitive nations today, check it out there. Whether we talk about the largest economies, all of which have risen to their levels of competitiveness through knowledge. And research is a key area. It is in that circumstance that you identify R and D. And so for me, I just felt when there is a gap, uh, back in the university, in the campuses, uh, was my job at Tech Lecturers, engaging in idle discussions, or if anything at all, is likely to be around the issue of personal benefits, the salaries that we struggle for, yes, of course, things have been very bad. But after we get the salaries and all that, what are we giving back to our students and nation? I discovered that research has never been a priority. And one wonders if we could hope to make a difference, to impact on our nation as ivory towers, as leaders of research, if we are not addressing the issue of research. And uh, I noticed, by the way, that until Tech Fund in 2011, after the name ETF changed to Tech Fund, um, and then intervention for the purpose of providing research grants, as well as academic staff training up to PhD came on board, that uh, the, the research was never a priority. In fact, I would always recall 
that about 15 years ago, I discovered that as a professor in the Nigerian university system, the highest I could get for research was 80,000. 80,000 could not buy me easily the smallest of equipment in the laboratory. Uh, to do any basic analytical uh, research for, in my case, nutritional biochemistry for animals, I would need an amino acid analyzer. And at that time, an amino acid analyzer was 5 million. That is much lower. There are more expensive equipment beyond amino acid analyzer required to do many of the HPLCs, et cetera. And so it was obvious that It's like a uh, props connection is a bit. The Nigerian university system, virtually okay. there was. Prof, you are muted. And I felt that was really inadequate and that it was important that we raise it. And that's why from 2019, we raised it and made it annual. Uh, I spoke to the board of trustees of Ted Fund that I realized that our, the, the, the ivory towers, even the polytechnics and the College of Education cannot be relevant if we are not doing problem solving research as I call it. And if we are not addressing problems of our nation, whether it is uh, defense, in the, in, in the era of uh, security challenges, or it is medicine in the era of COVID-19, uh, Ebola, Lassa fever, et cetera, or it is the, the, the need for uh, research in respect of infrastructure, uh, environment, uh, agriculture, of course, value addition for the raw products and all that, and uh, adding value, of course, for export, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, I made a case to the Board of Trustees. They raised the amount to 5 billion for 2019. Last year, we succeeded in raising it again to 7.5 billion. And uh, this year, it is 8.5 billion. Now, I, 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 I just realized that I was getting support. And uh, that is why I proceeded to make the case to the Honorable Minister of Education that Nigeria, we should not be uh, a kind of uh, proceeding by knee-jerk reactions. When we discover, for instance, in the case of COVID last year, everybody went panicking. Uh, we discovered that, in fact, test, testing uh, facilities, basic uh, COVID testing facilities, we could not get them produced in our universities. That was very embarrassing and unacceptable. And so um, we 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 are hoping that we will continue to increase it. In fact, my, my thinking is it should not be less than 10 billion annually. But even then, don't forget that as I'm talking, the Tetfan Research Grant is presently the largest single research grant in Nigeria. But in fact, I have added an, an aspect. There is an aspect I call a uh, mega research grant up to 250 because the NRF that we give in Tetfan is it has a a funding volume of maximum of 50 million Naira. But I have introduced one from this year, we call it the mega research grant that we're able to give an institution or a group of researchers up to 250 million. Again, that is unprecedented in Nigeria. I am very happy to join you people. At the time, the National Research and uh, Tech Fund Research and Development Standing Committee, RDSC as we call it, has recommended a national R&D foundation for Nigeria. And if it comes into being already, a draft uh, executive bill is being processed. If it comes into being, if we get it, it moves to the Federal Executive Council, goes to the National Assembly, and we get it as a bill and is signed. My idea is let us have a foundation that will be the largest funding basket for research in Nigeria. But beyond that, um, the last speaker spoke about 
the uptake or commercialization of research outcomes. That is exactly one of the many things that we are looking at. We're not just going to be uh, putting up a foundation for the sake of throwing money on research. I mean, if I may just put it that way. No, we're not just throwing money on research. If there are outcomes of research, how do we ensure that they are uptaken? And it's in that context that we invited industry. The Tetfon RDSC has nearly uh, one quarter of the membership from the industry and research institutes. Most of the science and technology innovation research institutes in Nigeria are members of the Ted Fund RDSC. And so if we get the National R&D Foundation come into being, that will be the largest funding, research funding basket. I, I had a chat with the Minister of Agri uh, recently, and he said to me, the biggest problem we have in the Ministry of Agri or the Agri sector is the non-functionality of research institutes of the sector because they don't have money. Today, I want to say this embarrassingly, that a research institute, one of the great A research institute DGs visited me about two months ago and said to me, I could not believe it, that sir, do you know that we have less than 10 million per annum as a research grant in that institute? I couldn't believe it. When Ted Fund were making available, up to 50 million naira per grant. Now, I've just mentioned this thing for this purpose of our understanding the magnitude of the problem. I am happy to share my ideas and uh, I'm proud that a number of Nigerians, and I, I know beyond Nigeria, UNESCO is involved on this platform. Let me sincerely appreciate the, this platform, appreciate the facilitators and the organizers, and to assure you that Ted Fund we are determined to work with partners to deepen our vision about knowledge economy and particularly being driven through problem solving research. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Elias Bogoro, the ES of uh, TED Fund. We appreciate you, like I said earlier, for the immeasurable work you're doing Thank you. in uh, promoting research in Nigeria. And one of the good things that we're so blessed that you're with us today is that uh, our SDC is at a stage now that is still uh, being considered for approval at the Senate. That wise, we can incorporate the ideas we are bringing in now about open research and make sure that whatever has been submitted by the committee to date can be beefed up or incorporate some ideas, some novel ideas of open research, like we're saying. You just mentioned uh, 250 million mega research grant. By the time we incorporate everything yeah. in open research, I believe the, the weight on her tech fund alone as an institution will be reduced because you will have the avenue for sharing uh, infrastructure globally that you do not have to yeah. uh, totally use what you have in-house. You can share infrastructure with people across the globe. I believe that's mm -hmm. one of the very strong key points of this uh, open research initiative by the UNESCO. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Sure. I hope you will stay around for the Q&A. Uh, that will be coming up very shortly because I'm sure we have over 80 people here who will have some questions for you. Thank you very much, Prof, for your presentation. Um, let, let me go very quickly. Yes, uh, the RDSC is actually the one that recommended the NR, uh, uh, NRDF, that is National R&D Foundation, which is the one that the executive bill is being prepared. And by finally, uh, just to quickly, I uh, appreciate Professor Bashir Galadenchi for joining us. I thank you very much. I hope he doesn't last my longer. Hour. Thank you, Prof. Uh, that is well taken. Uh, Professor Galadenchi, you are most welcome, like uh, the E has like stated. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we will go straight to the presentation uh, with we're on time a bit pressed, it's past 11 already. We're supposed to go on a break by 11.15. So uh, I'm just thinking, uh, maybe we just go straight into the second session of the presentation after the presentation of Homo. I think so. 
Okay. Uh, let me just read the, bi the short biography of uh, Homo Hoya, the, the, the brain behind uh, LeapSense, an African framework for sustainable hope and science. Homo Hoya has been offering consultancy and management support for research and academic institutions in Nigeria for the last 20 years. He is currently the Chief Strategy Officer of the West and Central African Research and Education Network, WACRE, where he drives strategic growth in developing partnerships to sustain initiatives in his constituent uh, hindrance and facilitate plans for the future. He is the creator of the LipSense, like I said, initiative. He has been working with sister regional African RENs as REN, the Ubuntu Net Alliance, several national RENs, uh, library associations, universities, and research communities in Africa to build communities of practice and strengthen local and national services to support open science and research in Africa. Other partners uh, in the LipSense initiative include COAN, the EIFL, University of Sheffield, the National Institute of uh, Informatics in Japan, JN, and uh, Open Hair. Omo, please, let's have your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Tyro. Um, that, that bit about the brain behind LipSense makes me slightly uncomfortable. LipSense has been a very strong community effort. And we've had, you, you list, listed some of the partners, but there are many more partners than that now. So I'm hoping in the course of my presentation, I will be able to sort of describe how we have worked together. But before I start, I'd like to say I'm very pleased to be here. And I was listening to Professor Bogoro. I am really enthused by uh, the, the thinking and the approach. And I really hope that from this symposium, we would be able to contribute to an action plan that eventually ends up in that bill um, and drives uh, open science and research advancement in Nigeria. So without, since I don't have very much time, I will start very quickly. So can you confirm you can see my screen, please? Yes, we can. Excellent. So that's my title. It's going to be about LipSense, largely, and Africa Connect3. These two projects or initiatives are the constituents of this framework that I'm going to talk about. So my, the, the, my slides, I, I will try and rush through this. I don't want to keep you waiting. But I'm going to talk about the Africa Connect project, you know, about how we have uh, promoted and developed NRENs in Africa in the last 10 years. And we'll talk a bit about LipSense, uh, LipSense community, which is basically driving open science uh, adoption in Africa and how, how we can work with that on, on a national basis in Nigeria. And I will also sort of very, because there's not so much time, try to address some of the issues uh, or this sorry to break your homo yeah actually because we have agreed that we will not take a break you can use a break time too which is like i think 10 minutes so you Excellent. have enough time yeah. okay Fine. so yeah so so because you know uh, it's been raised in two presentations now the the whole research culture the the way we do research i would just also talk a little bit about what we would need to do uh, about um, fostering open science culture on campus uh, all of this is, I would be very happy to work with the Nigerian community to uh, document this in a proper action plan. And I'm sure some other members of the LipSense community who I see in the group will be very pleased to do that too. So a bit more about NRENs in Africa. So the Africa Connect project is in its third iteration. Now in the first iteration, what we call Africa Connect, it was confined, uh, that happened between 2011 and 2015, that was confined to East and South Africa. And at that time, uh, the, this is a collaboration between the European Commission and African partners. At the time, it was adjudged that, you know, the Western Central Africa wasn't ready. Although we had the likes of Main One and Glow, the amount of fiber that we had in countries, maybe we had some in Nigeria and Ghana, but they, across the region, uh, there were we had a paucity of fiber connections, terrestrial fiber. So the first 
first project was uh, concentrated on Eastern South Africa. In the second and third iterations of the project, uh, things had moved on in West Africa. So it now the three partners, the three regions, West and Central Africa, Eastern South Africa, and North Africa are now partners in the Africa Connect 2 project. And the last iteration is the one we just started just before the COVID. And incidentally, it is almost funny. It's like, you know, we anticipated that we'll be needing some of this sort of infrastructure. So most of the project, uh, the, 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 in the first two, it was, they were very connectivity focused. But in the third one, we sort of inverted the priorities a little bit. So what we have is a project that has connectivity elements in it, but now it was going to broaden the scope and focus on above the net services, as I will tell you. Then you have some project data there. It's going to last till 2023. It's a 37.5 million euro budget. 80% of that is, you know, was provided by the European Commission and the remaining 7.5 million is provided by the three regional RENs, by the African partners, WACREN, ASREN, and the Buntinet Alliance. Out of that lot, 23 million is reserved for connectivity, equipment, and cloud. So as of today, um, we have there are 38 African NRENs, different countries that have actually established formal organizations that are, that are looking to connect the community in a, in a high-speed network. Out of those 38, we have managed to connect 22 countries in the 10 years that we have been in existence. So it's listed there in uh, the Wakran region, which is my, your, I mean, my home region, we have seven connected countries, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, and Togo. And we're about to connect Mali now. And these are all growing networks. Every day they are increasing the capacity they have. They are connecting more institutions and sharing uh, this very vital resource. So um, I said, you know, uh, I'm very happy to take the questions. I'm just going to try and keep this. I hope somebody can actually put the website link in the chat so people can also sort of know where this is. But the objectives of the Africa Connect 3 project are very simple. One is to increase, to enhance human cap cap capital development. So we've talked about, you know, the orientation of our researchers. We've talked about, you know, the in some cases where we have researchers that don't have the equipment or the, uh, the tools to work with. Now, those things slow us down. And like Professor Gogoro said, we, we do need to unlock the potential that actually exists. And this, we, this will happen through increased access to digital infrastructures and technologies. So our main four outputs in Africa Connect 3. One, the first one is the, the, the one that we know without which we can actually sort of do very much. So we do need to have access to affordable infrastructure. Uh, the second one is to uh, provide dedicated services and applications for the research community. And the third one is to build capacity and to generally raise uh, the use. I, now we say digital transformation a lot. I think a, a, a misstep would be digital migration because there's still a lot of things we do that are not sufficiently digital. So within Africa Connect 3, we, we have been, it's been uh, a year, we were slowed down by COVID like everybody else, but we have, we, have, we picked up towards the end of the year. So some of the outputs that we have planned have, have started to come through. So one of the things we're doing is service outreach to uh, science communities and deploying the applications that, you know, support them. Uh, these two that are on the screen, eduid.africa and trustbroker.africa are, applications that help with trust and identity because you see when you share and collaborate you do need to know who is who so that you can actually provide the right level of authority and act of authorization and access to these platforms tools publications or whatnot so without identity a lot of what we are saying won't happen so what we are doing in africa connect 3 is providing 
a robust, scalable uh, platform that can be used when countries don't have their own infrastructure or, or can be used as a template to build local infrastructure. I'm pleased to say that Nigeria uh, recently sort of moved the agenda forward in this aspect. And then and there is a Nigerian variety of this platform that exists. Another thing is cybersecurity. So as, as we start to get more and more digital, we have to have uh, the frameworks, the, uh, you know, the people who can make this infrastructure that we invest in safe and secure for our use. And then there's also, it's also the, um, the need, because uh, the, the, the world isn't such a great place when it comes to, as we know, so I, I saw a question uh, about you know, insecurity. So this insecurities also happen digitally. So we do need to have uh, the, the, the wherewithal to support them. So that's Africa Connect 3 in a nutshell. I hope you'll be able to look at our, the website for Africa Connect 3 and sort of get more information there. So, but I want to actually speak more about LibSense. Uh, so LibSense, LibSense is, is trying to uh, build open science capacity uh, across Africa. And this is really community driven. So we have NRENs, librarians, information specialists, and all kinds of people, researchers, uh, working together around open science at different levels. So some of our community is at the institutional level. They are just working within their campuses, trying to drive open science. Some work at national level, like the NRENs or the library associations. Some of us work at regional level. I work at that level. And the idea, is to support the cultural change that has been discussed you know, in, a, in the previous presentations, is to provide technical, coherent technical support across the spectrum uh, that, is, um, that we can all reuse. So there was uh, the LF speaker talked about open source software, that's one dimension. And the other bit is to actually build capacity. How do we do open research? What do we, how do we support the infrastructure that we have? How do we operate these journals, these open journals, open uh, research data management platforms? And how do we develop services that are contextual to our environment? Uh, Professor Tayoro mentioned something earlier that I thought was quite instructive. There is a global view of open science, and Anna did the same as well. There's a global view of open science, which is evolving, but it's clearly there, and we know what the elements are. But we believe in LibSense that this is a global view, that we need to, that what's, what's most important about realizing the benefits of open science is applying it in your local and national contexts without sort of having to explain too much. We know that uh, the way we do things in Nigeria, for instance, will certainly not be the way uh, the, um, say in the US, they would approach the same problem just because we have a different environment, we have different people, we have different needs. So that's really LibSense. And LibSense, um, that, is, that is my claim to fame, uh, you know, sort of that name, library support for embedded NREN services and e-infrastructure. And there's a little story there I'd like to share. So this was um, prior to uh, Wakren participating in Africa Connect 2. We had, we had been in a number of European Union projects, smaller projects, pretty much what the European Commission calls uh, support actions, coordination and support actions. Now, those, those sort of projects are supposed to prepare the ground for a bigger project. So in one of those projects, uh, we had, the idea was to build capacity amongst researchers, and we thought we would do that by producing some sort of uh, manuals, documentation, but this was 2015 to 2017. At the time, the open research, open science, open data movements were, start, were evolving and getting more traction. It has started to become clearer that, you know, open science in that direction was the next level of knowledge production uh, in the academy. Uh, and then we actually were very successful with uh, in the second project, so a project called Saigaya. And 
rode the wave to come up with an early version of what we call an open science platform. So it had different elements, you know, could had a repository, it had the identity bits, it had uh, something for a journal, and it had uh, cloud resources to support data science. So now we have this nice shiny platform. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough to use. But then we, re we realized that, you know, it was like having, it was like building roads with our cars. As the NREN, as the research networks, we were focused on the infrastructure, uh, but, and we were connected to researchers, but there was a missing element. Uh, as we investigated that, we realized that, you know, what was missing was the uh, library or the, the library function, the librarian function, the custodian, the curator of this, of this, uh, of the data and the, uh, and the publications and the operators of these repositories that we're going to build or we're building. So that sort of drove the emergence of Libsense. It became uh, an imperative of the NRENs to connect with the library community and see how we could drive uh, these infrastructure deployments together forward. So in the, the I, as, as I go on, I will talk a little bit more about the history, but I want you to understand what the, how this framework works so that you know, when we look at applying it in Nigeria, it is, um, it is easy to work together. So I have already said the overall strategy is to build communities of practice, it is to strengthen local and national services, make it contextual, make open science, open research, whatever name you want to call it, um, contextual. It's got to be bottom up. It has to be distributed. It cannot be central and it has to be heterogeneous. Now, in, on an African basis, in LibSense, we work in three languages. The languages are most predominant in Africa, Arabic, English, and French. And we want this is supposed to be an inclusive, and we, we do all we can to make it as inclusive as possible. And have we have a special interest in furthering indigenous and traditional knowledge? In terms of organization, we have three pillars that we work with, and you will see these three pillars repeated in everything we do. One is the policy level. So open science policies, governance issues, and leadership. Another bit is the one that we have spoken about here, uh, you know, that I, everybody first talks about because we do agree without infrastructure, a lot of this won't happen. So the third, second pillar is infrastructure. So we're talking open access journals, repositories for publications and data, and these sort of services that expose this, uh, this infrastructure to the end user. The third, the third pillar is capacity building. I already mentioned that, communities of practice, training. Now, if you look on the right side of the screen, on the right side of, the, of my slides, the idea here is to, is to demonstrate how we work. So this is top down and bottoms up almost at the, at the same time. So we're going to be at a continental level. We are doing many things. So we are rolling out some, uh, what we call in LibSense Open Science Roadmaps. The idea is to make sure that African priorities are maintained. This event, uh, thanks to Eco Connect, uh, uh, who uh, has been a very sort of um, uh, contributing member of the LibSense community, um, this, we're hosting the LibSense Open Science Roadmap in Nigeria uh, as their host thanks to Tedfund as well. We have run similar in Uganda that was hosted uh, in partnership with Iran as well, but it was actually run by the uh, Library Association there. In another week or two, we will be doing the same in Tanzania, and that will be hosted by the Tanzanian Research Network and their collaborators. Now, and this is, and that is the policy side. So just to sort of get you familiar with the three different pillars that we work in. On it, in terms of infrastructure, there is some infrastructure that works best at um, continental level, or maybe sometimes 
that is sort of driven by the fact that a community or a community already exists at that level. And so they already, because they're working together as a community, then they, you, can, you can find a platform that they can all share. And then in, for capacity building, that is we're pulling all our resources across Africa to create capacity in terms of whatever form. Sometimes it is templates, sometimes it is uh, formal training, and sometimes it's working together in capacity building projects, be they developing courses together that we can all reuse or tools or a big broad variety. So I have some examples that we've had in the last um, couple of years. So uh, Anna had talked about the uh, UNESCO global consultation where we were very involved in that and uh, actually made a statement which we submitted to the process. Uh, the link is there, we call it Open Science Africa. What it does, it spells out what we understand as the way we can do this. We can do open science and provide infrastructure that is sustainable. At the moment, I won't bore you with the details. I'm sure some of this will be discussed tomorrow in tomorrow's sessions are a little bit more technical. But at the moment, there are different models uh, of open science and some that are quite popular um, in, the, in the North. I would say I'm using the North loosely. I mean, outside Africa, mostly European and the US, do not work for us because of the of cost. And in, in quite a few cases, there are legacy issues that we don't have. Well, if we can start rounding up now. Rounding up? Yeah. Okay. You should say break time already. I'm, that is, you see, I'm going to have to speed this up. So anyway, um, examples, examples of, um, examples of what I'm talking about is a, a some people might have seen a recent, uh, you know, MOU with Roof Forum. Roof Forum is a multi-institutional agricultural organization. It has members from 140 countries, quite a few members in Nigeria. Uh, they need a platform like that. We are building one for them. We, we talked about Africa, but that's continental. So I'm going to speed through now since I've lost time. On a regional basis, what we are doing is we are aligning policy with regional organizations, higher education organizations. So in, in West Africa, you know, uh, continentally, that's the AAU, the Association of African Universities, but there's also CRUFAOC, the rectors in French universities. In South and East Africa, there's the SAROA, the equivalent in South and East Africa. Same thing, we are on the infrastructure level, we are doing similar on the regional level. So the examples in this case will be the uh, capacity building workshops that we have, uh, that we have been doing, skills profiles, webinars, to basically identify what skills the librarians and researchers need to be able to uh, move into open science, open research, and providing that. And we do have a program that we're initiating from 2021 that is going to be focused, and then of course, again, in collaboration with our members. So Nigeria is a member of that project that will be focused on early career researchers. So these are researchers within 10 years of their PhD. So that will go from like, you know, master's to postdoc. But the idea is to, and, but that we know that that is the, will be the most productive sort of uh, cadre and we want to work with them. And on a national level, on a national level, we are doing this basically, working with you guys to see if we can support your policies and support community efforts at infrastructure level. I talked about the other countries we're having national open science roadmaps in. So Nigeria is one of seven right now that are already doing this. We are supporting the REN to establish shared open access, open access repository and publishing platforms. We know that part of that is a demonstrator we're having in Nigeria in collaboration with Echo Connect and uh, uh, an organization called Coco Foundation. And then at the institutional level, we are, so we are working with a community of mostly librarians who are developing these institutional open access, open science policies and open access uh, repository uh, 
statements and policies. At the end of the, but that is work at the institutional level. So we have a broad, broad partnership spoke, scope and networks that we work with. We have the core foundational teams. I, I can't, I have to stress that, you know. So yes, Wakren initiated this, but it wouldn't have been possible without the uh, support in visioning the goal that came from uh, IFUL. IFUL is a uh, full is electronic, electronic information for libraries. They've been working with librarians in Africa for a very long time. They were the, for us as research networks, they were the gateway to li libraries in Africa. We've had research information science support from the University of Sheffield. And we've had global perspective and international alignment from the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. Now, this is as a whole driven by the three research networks, you know, WACREN, ASREN, and Ubuntu Alliance. And this, at this point in time, we're looking for more, has come from the Africa Connect 3 project. But you can see I might share, my slides will be shared. We do have external collaborators as well, you know, some, all of the actors in the, um, in the open space, in the open science space. Since I've run out of time, I'm going to be very quick with this. If you don't mind, uh, Professor Atayiro, I just thought this is important. Two, two minutes. Two minutes, I will finish it. So I talked about some of the things we did at the beginning. Incidentally, the very first workshop we ran uh, that led to this was actually run in Nigeria at the uh, NUC. And it was an open access workshop looking to, the, you know, how do we create effective research working with libraries. And that sort of developed into, that was 2016, we moved on and sort of ran a survey, first of all, uh, in the Wakran region. First of all, actually, first of all, in Nigeria with the with Newly, with the Nigerian University Librarians, then in the Wakran region, then this was adopted by the other research networks and it became an African project. Then we did a Pan-African survey to understand what the issues were, ran some agenda setting workshops and basically understood what we needed to do. And then some of all of that was fed at this time, the community was growing and getting uh, quite developed. And this was fed into the Africa Connect 3 project, which now provided funding for the webinars we had with the skill profile well, for the librarians to you know, understand the, how they evolve into these new roles. We did that in both French and English ran some capacity building workshops, and then connected with the UNESCO consultation in 2020. So I've already talked about that. We also have other similar partnerships on a global level, uh, which one that is actually quite uh, important to mention is the one we have with Latin America. Now, the, 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 the relevance there is the it is not exactly the same, but we are closer in context uh, than the North. And then in Latin America, open access, has, uh, they have taken open access to levels that are actually quite admirable. And they have a very, very robust framework for developing open access. So now they're moving from the open access platforms and the stages that they had reached into the new open science uh, space. So we, I've talked about the open science roadmaps and things. That was the beginning of 2021. We shall move on to that. We're about to start some regional policy development workshops. We're having the first in uh, the Ubuntu Alliance Conference in November. Uh, that's the Eastern South African Network. Now, the idea with those policy workshops is to sit with heads of institutions uh, first of all, from uh, and we'll do this on a regional basis. So when it, when we come to West Africa, then Nigeria will be involved in that. But the idea is to sit with the DVC research, DVC ACAD, the vice chancellors, to, to, to sort of discuss using case studies, using examples in our environment, how we move from the big, nice UNESCO global sort of uh, guidelines into a situation where we actually start to do this on, on a campus level. So this is my last slide. I'll be very, 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 very quick now since it's, um, we're talking about institutional OS culture. So yes, there's gonna be training. Basically the training is 
how do people learn how to do this? Well, another thing we will do that we have learned from uh, the open science, open source, and other open, uh, open movements is sustaining communities on campus who sort of become uh, a self-help uh, self group that take the training and drive that. So this will, op this will create sort of an open science commons on campus. The other thing we're going to be doing is working, uh, have running leadership programs for this will be for senior management. So they can understand what kind of policies uh, they need uh, to provide incentives to drive um, open science. I'm really sorry I took so much time, but thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Homo, for that uh, very, very uh, concise presentation of uh, the things we're doing with LipSense. Uh, we started with uh, Hannah giving us the global view of this open science thing, if you will. And now, Homo has just shown us how that we need to take it contextual, make it bottom up, and uh, make sure that indigenous knowledge is not jettisoned while we're doing this. Thank you very much. I'm sure the organizers of this uh, symposium will still think of another symposium so that we can explore all these uh, things we're discussing in more detail, even uh, from the ones we'll be taking tomorrow. Uh, let me use this opportunity to encourage the participants to put their questions in the queue and hey, we are four there already. I'm sure we can still invest more. While we go to the next uh, presentation, which will be from uh, Dr. Popo Hola, I believe. Doc, are you ready for us? Yes, I can't share my screen. I would like to share my screen. That's because Homo has not stopped sharing. Homo, can you please stop sharing? Uh, while Doc is putting on his slide, uh, let me read his profile. Dr. Mustafa Popola, uh, will be speaking on funding for open research, a third fund perspective. Dr. Popola serves as the technical assistant to the executive secretary of Third Fund on Research and Development Matters. He is an associate professorial fellow of global studies at the Center for Excellence on Migration and Global Studies, National Open University of Nigeria. Presently, he is the coordinator of the technical coordination team of the Third Fund Research and Development Standing Committee, the RDSC, with an overarching goal of promoting the establishment of the National Research and Development Foundation in Nigeria. He is a fellow, Institute of Chartered Economists of Nigeria, Development Practice Academy, Chartered Institute of Corporate Mentoring and Coaching of Nigeria, and Institute of Management Consultant. He is also a certified commercial diplomat of the City of London in the United Kingdom. Dr. Popola, your presentation, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to actually speak to this uh, very important topic uh, around uh, open research in Nigeria. And uh, I want to believe that uh, the background has actually been laid and I will not uh, take much time. Uh, let me permit me to actually do some a bit of protocol. Uh, recognize the Executive Secretary of TED Fund. I've uh, been on this call. Thank you very much, sir. We know you actually took a long time traveling yesterday and uh, you struggled very hard to join us this morning despite uh, a lot of appointment over there. We appreciate your time, sir, and believe in the process. I've seen the President Academy of Science and the number of people that are very esteemed in terms of our hierarchy in the Research and Development Foundation. Many head of the coordinators of our 13 thematic groups have actually gone, joined to honor the ES. And we see some other people that have come from uh, the university system, because I think this morning I shared with me about, about 10 vice chancellors. Uh, really, we uh, appreciate your time. and. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a good one for us, uh, since all of us are actually meeting at this point, to see that the need for us to move towards uh, open science in Nigeria, and uh, essentially looking at open research within the context of what we are doing at State Fund. 
Uh, let me start my presentation by actually going through some of the, uh, showing us some of the background um, to my presentation. Yeah. yeah, so I, I think I'm going to take uh, us through some of those things that we are doing at Ted Fund and the perspective that we are looking at uh, going forward. And uh, how that one actually is being mainstream into what we call the new paradigm at Ted Fund. And uh, some of the innovative uh, funding models we are looking at. And uh, let me say clearly that uh, within the contextual framework, of uh, what we are doing in the establishment of a National Research and Development Foundation. We are factored in the issue of open science, but it is not something that is cast in gold. Uh, so we can actually look at, uh, take other inputs and let us uh, work at it together. Yes, uh, as a researcher myself, what uh, I understand is that, uh, yes, research might look at uh, a structural, uh, a functional component of the O science and uh, the DNA of any science, uh, we're talk, going to be talking about is actually the research. That's the way we've seen it. Uh, as life scientists, you understand with me that uh, what we experience is what we call the um, phenotypes. Uh, you see the phenotypic expression of things, but what actually make it happen is in the genotype essentially. So for us, people speak about science, but what actually drives science? is the DNA of it that we call the research. And the research actually have a triple goal in an ideal tertiary institution system. I think that has not, can never be uh, overemphasized. The issue of uh, uh, anybody in the academia being a, pr a practitioner when it comes to the uh, issue of uh, research, community service and teaching. Yeah, uh, over the years we've actually concentrated on teaching. And uh, when we are teaching, what we are rolling out are people that can teach possibly, and uh, they can hardly do much of research. So that is what is actually changing now. So in between, uh, the way we usually position the tripod is to make the teaching on the left, research at the middle, and the uh, community service at the end. So for you to actually shape both the teaching and, uh, and the community service, you need to actually embark on research because that's what you can take to the community. Um, so and, uh, in the innovation systems that uh, we believe is anything across the world now, you can see that it is actually enabled by research and development. And uh, it is only the ICT infrastructure that can drive that. And uh, many of these innovations actually imagine, uh, are actually are triggered by emerging technologies for competitiveness. And uh, we know every product and services across the globe now is um, approaching what we call the competitiveness and in making country or products, businesses or services to be competitive in the knowledge economy, you need, it has to be driven by our products and outcomes of research. And um, when we're talking about uh, research generally, then open research actually has another space there. And um, for us to understand what open research, it, uh, what it is, try as much as possible to give a definition that is more or less like a modular innovation system for practice. I think that the issue of uh, community of practice was actually emphasized by OMO, which is essentially part of what we are looking at now because functional science without border is the only thing that can impact the society and the people's needs. And that is the essence of what we are talking about. You can see side by side, if you put the triple helix model that we are talking about, let me put it correctly, people-centric triple helix model. So many people will call it a quadruple helix model. And at the same time, you are looking at open science, you can see uh, they are twins and uh, they are actually go hand in hand. And all of this are what is being crystallized in what we call the third front paradigm shift uh, that we are looking at how we want to reform in a very rapid way, the R&D ecosystem in Nigeria uh, to accommodate what is needed uh, for the 21st century. Uh, for me, uh, I think we're going to be looking at uh, some of the basics of uh, open research, there are a lot of definition, but centrality of workflow and best practice is key. As a life scientist, again, I can actually say that part of what we do in, in silico science today actually allow us to share notes across the world when we actually work in any particular item or a particular sample in a dry lab. So because of technology today, we can have what we call the dry lab, and through the in silico science, you can actually do a lot of uh, genetic constructs across border. And uh, because of the uh, database, uh, in terms of a robust 
bioinformatic infrastructures that we have now. We can share data across the world and uh, people can be across the world working a particular project uh, without uh, actual physical mobility across borders. So, and uh, you cannot complete the life cycle of R&D activity, including innovation and tra uh, knowledge transfer system without imbibing uh, the culture of uh, open science. Essentially, we're going to be talking about data-driven R&D. And uh, I mean, since we know that that's the currency of the new 21st century data, we need to actually do a lot of that and then data sharing and transfer, including management and archiving. That is where you have strengths in other knowledge economy. And that is part of what we are actually advocating here. Uh, you can't do much of research advocacy and communication if you are not open and that the research and researcher feasibility becomes very imperative under the open science, intellectual property and commercialization. Let me pause a bit, people think that when you practice in open science or intellectual property, uh, might be challenged. No, that's not the truth. Uh, because if you look at uh, the WIPO patent scope, uh, we have about 190 million uh, intellectual property products that are already there and uh, actually facilitates commercialization. Open science actually uh, makes you to be smarter to see parts of your work or every I mean, protocol that you need to actually uh, attach intellectual property uh, to and then make it available. It's part of open science. So people should not see it as, no, we will not be able to um, enjoy our intellectual property through open science. Not like that, it's a, it's a function of how it's been practiced. And I spoke about interoperability, integrity, scalability, and uh, what uh, uh, we usually call scientific fidelity. Uh, I think those are the things that can actually be achieved because uh, across the world, we need to know that uh, you can be practicing your science in, in the corner again. Uh, science actually foster collaboration, inter intra transdisciplinary uh, work packages and allow people to work across board, uh, across nation without border. Let me speak to the Nigeria a bit about uh, national realities. And uh, for us, we need to know why it is very important for us in Nigeria. Uh, then the most populous black nation, third in population, across the world by 2050. And uh, now we're looking at about 200 million people. I mean, out of the 18, I mean, 15 countries of ECOWAS, which actually taken more than 50%, that is a fact and is given. But what is important is our strategic location at GMT plus one, uh, which is associated with a favorable climate. This has been queried and uh, we actually know why we have abundance of resources across our uh, regions in, in Nigeria and across the states. So we have not taken advantage of our location anyway on the global map because when we interrogate what GMT plus one means to Nigeria, then I think we're going to appreciate the kind of resources that we are sitting on and uh, we need uh, science and uh, research and development, particularly open science, to actually fast track their development. And uh, we have an advantage that uh, now part of the deduction for R&D with about 20% investment credit being promoted by Investment Promotion Council in Nigeria is an advantage allowance that can be leveraged in funding open science and the full tax holidays now in terms of 100% capital allowance, especially economic zone, is an advantage that we can take because what is going on in economic zones are require a lot of scientific infrastructure. And just yesterday, I think the president, federal uh, um, government just announced that it's going to be uh, opening up another two or three economic zones uh, in the country. We can take the advantage uh, in practicing open science because many of these economic zones are actually uh, being driven by projects or businesses that are innovative uh, in approach. So for Tech Fund, we need to understand Tech Fund at a glance because uh, we know many of our, our participants today are not from Nigeria. And um, part of what Tech Fund is doing as of today is that uh, over 226 beneficiary institutions actually is the core funding agency that is intervening in the tertiary education system in Nigeria, Polytechnic universities, colleges for education. And uh, we are, I mean, we appreciate that uh, in Nigeria, the spread of this tertiary uh, education system is across the 36 states that we have and there are a lot of abundant resources, meaning that we could leverage on this uh, uh, state and uh, the abundant resources, locality, indigenous technologies and the resources in that place for us to actually practice a lot of open science and uh, I uh, agree with me, you, or it's better for me to say at this point that uh, we have about 10,000 fiscal infrastructure projects 
and um, about 150,000 funded projects since establishment of Threat Fund, uh, about national research uh, fund, re uh, research projects. We have about 1,000 grants uh, since inception, about 300 of those projects are running now. And I think in a matter of uh, maybe latest next month, we're going to be having an additional 217 projects that uh, are in the range of about 50 million. And that has actually uh, aggregated to what we call, I mean, what we see there as 9 billion that has been invested or will be invested by the end of this year uh, in the NRA uh, across the country in stationary based research that was mentioned about uh, over 2,000 of them funded. And uh, we know as of today, uh, because we, there must be justification for our paradigm shift, uh, about 80% of the developments are in the brown infrastructure, about 30%. Uh, 20% is in content development and 3% of that as a 2021 is in grants on research. And I think that is the paradigm that we are looking at that this has to change for us to institutionalize R&D in Nigeria. So, and uh, like I mentioned again, for us to do this, uh, there is a new drive uh, for a 10 year old institution that is state funded by uh, this year. We understand that the tripod of a teacher and educational system, like I mentioned uh, earlier, is teaching research and community service, but that is uh, supposed to be functional anyway. So, but we have a structural tripod for innovative development, which is science, technology, and innovation. That's the STI. So, for those, I mean, for R and D, STI to actually have an arm shape, we need to actually look at the functional tripod of sustainable development, which is essentially. Uh, the open research or what we call the research development and knowledge space. And uh, when we look at the global competitiveness of any nation, uh, people actually leverage on research, innovation, development, but in our own case, under the NRF, I mean, NRDF that is, being, uh, that is upcoming, we are looking at research, innovation, development, and enterprise. We call it Project RIDE, and that is going to be giving a good ride from my, for Nigeria as a country from a resource-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. So our logo around that is going to be that uh, we're going to be associated with open research that is embedded in our right that is taking Nigeria to the next level. Permit me to share some of this data for our information so that at least we can see what is the flow uh, like. Uh, like I mentioned, you can see that the total here is about uh, 6.7 billion. And I'm talking about uh, 9 billion in the previous slide, meaning that I've now incorporated uh, the data for 2020, which is about uh, 217 research projects that have just been approved for funding under NRF. So uh, since that has not been uh, disbursed, that is why you don't see the data here, but it has been approved and, um, in less than a month. That is going to give us uh, uh, what we are looking for. Again, you can see the sequence. Uh, in terms of 2012, where we have the first NRF just 12 uh, approved project, 2013 about 20, 2014 about eight, 2015, 2016, you can see that 2017, 2018, there was nothing. Essentially, that was when the ES was on, uh, on compulsory sabbatical anyway. Uh, and uh, by the time it comes back, you can see it's like it clear up what was missing because somebody was in charge. Who does not actually believe uh, in the R&D drive? And uh, that is the result we can see from these statistics. And uh, when it came back in 2019, the first punch it actually gave was to actually make sure that we have 128 uh, approved research. And I'll say as of 2020, it has increased to 217. So that is part of the paradigm that is changing. And uh, moving forward to the new paradigm objectives, we can see that we're looking at content development. Since I've actually talked about brown infrastructure components, yes, we built a lot of buildings, but we are uh, interested in what is happening inside those buildings. And uh, we are front loading R&D and institutionalization in Nigeria, not in tertiary institution again, only we are talking about across the country. We want a situation whereby departments, private sector, companies, businesses have R&D units. And we are able to actually aggregate all these functions and uh, processes in a national coordinated uh, platform, a national coordinated platform that we call the NRDF. Then we want to actually restore the academic leadership and the scholastic excellence at our senior institution, like the has mentioned, a lot of people does not even take it serious that you can actually get the very best and be the very best uh, in the academia. Rather, uh, the site also has actually taken a lot of people 
they sway from the core work that uh, they need to do and they, they are actually doing uh, some ancillary work and at the same time because of the issues so for for us in restoration in the restoration of academic leadership and scholastic excellence we see research as core because if you have a funding for research even if as, i mean if you are on strike because of teaching that is the way i've seen it they're going to be in the uh, in your institution carry on your research because you know it is time bound and you have another funding for that so in essence research is going to actually recalibrate the system in our educational system are uh, going forward and uh, we look at a global ranking of our institution which is sadly not too good now i want to believe that what can drive that immediately is for us to look at uh, r d and uh, actually see how we want to facilitate a lot of uh, open research in our institutions uh brain drain syndrome People just speak about it. Nobody has been taking action except Ted Fund that is looking at it uh, from a perspective of brain drain, brain, true brain tap to brain gain. Just last uh, two weeks, this was uh, one of our discussion at Finland uh, when we are engaging them in the first international diplomacy around uh, the establishment of National Research and Development Foundation in Nigeria. You could be drained as a Nigeria somewhere, but we are expecting you that we can tap from your brain by contributing to a project and research through open research across the world. You could be somewhere and be contributing to a researcher here. We saw somebody in Finland that has about four PhD students at ABU and they still collaborate. And uh, for us, we want to believe that at the end of the day, when the infrastructure are right and you build a lot of uh, human capital resources over here, then you can actually be gained again after being drained. So that is our process to it, and we are clear about what we want to achieve at every stage of this process. Our global collaboration is key. We can't do it all alone. And at the same time, uh, the special purpose vehicle that is going to be driving this new agenda of paradigm shift is the National R&D Foundation. We expect everybody to be on board to give us uh, the requisite support. And uh, we want to believe that open science, open research is going to be an integral part of what we'll be doing going forward. Permit me to share with you that uh, Part of what we are looking at at uh, NRDF uh, and uh, even in the ARDSC that was set up a standing committee on research and development by the ES is to actually look, in, look at these thematic areas uh, because we believe they are the contributor of over 85% of our GDP. In this matrix, what we are looking at is that uh, part of the parameters, in fact, the major parameter that is used to actually measure the nation in its participation when it comes to R and is the gross expenditure as a function of the GDP. So for us, looking at this, and uh, we are clear that about 85% um, uh, contribution to our GDP are from this sector. Those are the things that actually make us uh, provide a uh, basis for the selection of this sector. And these sectors, uh, we have uh, a team of about 165 uh, I mean, uh, committee member, comprised of people from the academia, CEOs and capital of industry, including Dangote and um, Innocent Motors, a lot of them. And they will have people from the government too to actually model our people-centric uh, triple helix. So those are the people that are practicing in this area. And I think they've worked together for one year and then we're actually having our, both our technical reports. Uh, we have the national R&D master plan now uh, for the NRDF. We have the project development document, project information document the five-year strategic plan and uh, some other documents, including the cross-cutting map. So we're going to be looking, uh, moving forward, we're going to be looking at proposing common expenditure framework for this new thinking under the triple helix, government, private, and academia. Remember, I make it clear that it's going to be people-centric. Uh, so, so if people call it four legs, I think it's fine. We are looking <laughs> at these funding sources and uh, we are looking at both local and direct investments, including mainstreaming the issue of crowdfunding and the crowd talent management. And this is going to be the expenditure aspects. These are core elements for the expenditure going forward under this new regime. And I think uh, the committee, the RDSC committee actually proposed the way this should be funded going forward, not only looking at government like what we have in third one, which is 2% of the tax uh, education, what is then regarded as educational tax being uh, uh, collected uh, from the FIRS, which is purely government. We are looking at 65% of what we are going to be leveraging at National Research and Development Foundation to come from government, 15% from industry, 5% from R&D, entrepreneurs should be contributing 5%. 
Development partner about 2% and researcher and innovator just uh, 2%. Uh, in practice, we're going to be looking at the total budget of R&D foundation at around 5 billion US dollars. That's going to be around 2.5 trillion uh, over a period of five years. Uh, and uh, these are the areas that we are looking and the percentage that is allocated to each of these uh, areas that I've just mentioned for us to uh, appreciate the new thinking and uh, the way we want to go uh, going forward. And uh, we actually look at uh, our demand-driven uh, open R and D R for D model. That is that is research for development model. So we have a model that was developed courtesy of the technical coordination team of the Research and Development Foundation, a research and development uh, standing committee of TED Fund that is uh, that has proposed uh, National Research and Development Foundation. So in this model, we can see clearly that even if we are talking about research going forward. We have actually tried to integrate open research. Wherever you see the OP, it means open research, uh, because uh, essentially we've seen what the old world is talking about. And I think it is important that we realize that we are moving almost at the same pace with what UNESCO is doing. And it's going to be a good one uh, if some of these um, approaches can be integrated in our, our final document. We are open to work with UNESCO, either in Nigeria at national uh, or international level and all other partners that are on this platform to make this one clear, I mean, to make it better. So we can see idea generation going forward, uh, research and development, uh, research outcomes and innovation, looking at evaluation of R&D and IP assessment. This is intellectual property. If it's not patentable, it remains, but it's only when it's patentable that it can actually go through the business analysis. We know there is a valley between a business analysis, a proof of concept and the uh, development of a pilot. So, uh, and uh, we are actually taking care of that. We're going to be looking at product development, market and end users analysis, and uh, we want a sustainable funding for this particular uh, system. So what we are saying in essence now is that we are not looking at government as only the funder. We actually want to create a system that will be self-sustaining. And at the same time, we can actually contribute to the development of the country as a whole and uh, be a new leader in the new energy economy in Africa. So all of these are part of what our thinking and uh, this is a model that we've actually uh, developed. Um, and I think uh, we've been doing this for the past almost a year. Uh, the RDSC was inaugurated about uh, 24th of September. And uh, we've actually, we have about 32 milestones and uh, we are left with only uh, six milestones to go uh, for us to actually have, see the establishment of NRDF that is going to be the SPV uh, for the actualization of a lot of things, including open science uh, in Nigeria. So there is ongoing global engagement and they've uh, started that since April and it's going to be ending by November. By next Tuesday in eight days, we are going to be looking at the technical report that was generated by the thematic groups on One Health. For the first time, we are modeling One Health in Nigeria, uh, having environmental health, human health, animal health, and uh, the wildlife uh, uh, under the same roof about uh, uh, I think 19 members, 14 across of the very best we have in the ed sector. Uh, actually, that presentation next Tuesday is going to be given by the former vice chancellor of uh, Redeemer University. Uh, that is Professor Yuali Tomori. He's going to be leading the group. And I think it's going to be uh, a welcome development for a lot of people that are here to join to see what has been uh, one of the thematic groups, what have they done out of the 13. So the other ones will come thereafter. Then we're looking at having an engagement uh, uh, summit, including a review of the national, our, our national R&D uh, master plan by December. That's going to be like a summit. And we can incorporate some of those things that are just coming up here in this particular uh, session. We're looking at a visitation to some knowledge economies. We've just done the first one. It's for modeling and resource mobilization, including seeking partnership globally. Uh, we just finished with uh, Finland. We are actually looking at other continents and about five of them will be uh, our sample uh, so that we can actually do some studies to and see what's going on over there. Then we're looking at submission of the bill that is going to, that's what uh, the ES referred to as the draft bill. I expected passage of the bill by December and we are proposing that the upcoming National Research and Development Foundation that is going to be a platform to actually actualize open sciences among other things in Nigeria will be backed by uh, first quarter of 2022. In conclusion, we've looked at what we need to do and uh, we're actually clear about what is going on globally. And uh, we believe that uh, the National Research and Development Foundation 
we assist in institutionalization, mainstreaming and commercialization of research and development, including promotion of innovation and support, enterprise development for job and wealth creation in the knowledge driven economy of 21st century in Nigeria, so that we can actually stop talking about only resources. We can move into actions and see how we can actually translate uh, those resources into competitive products across the world. And they were, like I said, the only transitioning platform that we have identified is for us to work together and come up with National Research and Development Foundation. The bill is being worked on and we're going to finalize the bill and uh, it's going to be an executive bill that comes from the presidency through the National Assembly. And the moment we have the act, we can actually run with that. And uh, like I said clearly, we are looking at providing a right for sustainable development in Nigeria. And uh, I imagine new Nigerian that is going to be driven by knowledge going forward. I thank you very much for the attention. And I think I've not uh, actually spent excess time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Popola, for that uh, brilliant presentation as usual. Uh, one very strong takeaway from this presentation that I see, when you were presenting the, the amount of funds disposed uh, in that table, there was a very, very, very obvious lacuna when the EHES was on board and when he had to go on a sabbatical. I believe that uh, as a national body, the TED Fund, we should, we should try to see how we move away from uh, personalities to making things happen Either somebody is there or he is not there by uh, incorporating the right policies. The good work that uh, uh, Ted Fund is doing is well elaborated in your presentation, even taking advantage of the brain drain, uh, making gains out of them. This, this is quite laudable and the right concept is, is to be applauded. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. I can Thank see the know. number of questions are rising. We have nine of them now. Uh, some of them are being answered already. We we'll still share them in the Q and A session. And uh, like uh, Dr. Pukola rightly mentioned, uh, since we have a lot of uh, VCs and DVCs here and other people, please join us during the next presentation of the Global uh, Tech Fund uh, seminars that we have. Quite a number have been had already. We still have some to go. Thank you very much for that presentation. We're doing well with time. And we'll take the last presentation now from one of our conveners that's talking about Mr. Owen Iyoha, the CEO of uh, EcoConnect. If I know anything about Owen, I know that he is a very passionate person when it comes to the open paradigm. Anything open, you can see. If you see Owen there, you will see Homo there. I worked with them for some time as the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University. Uh, I will just read a short profile on uh, Mr. Iyoha. He will be speaking on making it possible, shared open infrastructure for the Nigerian research and uh, research community. Mr. Iyoha is the CEO of EcoConnect Research and Education Initiative where he has worked since his inception in 2009. He oversees infrastructure development, capacity building, and advocacy to develop all aspects of the research and education network and its community in Nigeria. Owen has over 25 years of experience working in the high city sector in the United Kingdom, the United States, and in Nigeria with companies including Sava Enterprise UK Limited, OpenLink Software Incorporated, and Datasphere Solutions Limited, providing high city consultancy and solution provider for major corporate organizations. Owen is a strong supporter of open source software, open science, open assets, and other open paradigms necessary to support the growth and the impact of technology and scholarly output in Nigeria. Owen, can we have your presentation, please? Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Atayero. And um, thank you, um, I don't know if the ES is still here, I'd like to acknowledge his presence and thank him for attending this symposium today. And I thank everyone for their patience to listen to these presentations. Uh, my presentation will be the last presentation for the day. 
um, and after which we'll engage in the panel sessions where we can deal with some of the questions that have been asked and also discuss how we actually move forward um, from, from here. All right, so. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, Owen, we can. Okay, excellent. If you can just make it full screen, though. Yes, I'll put it into presentation mode. Okay. Right, so um, I'm going to uh, present uh, based on the, the title of my presentation is Making it Possible, Shared Infrastructure for the Research and Education Community. So much has been uh, discussed, so many things have been said today, and I'm hoping we can explore that a whole lot more during the Q&A session that will take place after my presentation. Um, so what I'm going to really focus on here is what the infrastructures that are probably required to help and enhance the practice of uh, open science and open research. Right. Now, uh, in doing that, my presentation is going to be like in two parts. Um, the first part of uh, my presentation will deal with the open science journey that ECHO Connect has embarked upon and how it has informed what are the service offerings and infrastructure that is available from uh, ECHO Connect today. So for those of you that uh, do not know uh, ECHO Connect, uh, very simply put, we are very similar to NGREN. And so people might say, well, what NGREN, ECHO Connect, what, what's actually the difference? Well, um, ECHO Connect was actually established in 2009 prior to the establishment of, of NGREN. And uh, as the name implies, the goal then was to sort of um, bring institutions within the Lagos area into a, a research and education network um, as part of just a geopolitical cluster within, um, within Nigeria. Um, eventually, um, NGREN, uh, uh, emerged and about a couple of years later, um, but we still proponent, proponents of the idea that uh, because of the size of Nigeria, we should actually have clusters of uh, insti uh, institutional networks developed around the country and then try to aggregate those cl uh, clusters into a uh, backbone network that's got a high capacity for, for connectivity. So uh, that's really what uh, Echo Connect was about. So we were building and helping institutions with their campus networks and also looking at ways to make connectivity um, more, more affordable. And then as that went on, we began to introduce other services that run on the network. So these are like um, what we refer to as above the net services and research infrastructure. Um, that kind of work that we were doing with e-learning platforms, learning management systems, uh, DNS, and the other infrastructure caught the attention of institutions around the country. So today, Echo Connect works with many institutions right across right across the country. Um, we're a member of the Western Central African Research and Education Network, WACREN, um, and um, I think Omar has touched on, on that in his presentation. We have peering arrangements with WACREN. So essentially, uh, once you're part of the Nigerian REN, then ostensibly you can have access to the wider regional networks and the global REN networks and community because of the, the work WACREN do in that space. So, uh, Meco Connect's open science journey really started around 2012, 2013, when as part of uh, being a member of WACREN, we were introduced to the EI for Africa um, project. This was um, an EC, um, an F FP, F FP7 project actually that was funded by the European Commission. And the, the objectives of uh, this project was to 
uh, build capacity and expose African NRENs and institutions to uh, e-infrastructure. So uh, a number of thematic workshops were done ar around Africa and um, uh, EcoConnect actually hosted one of those in uh, 2014. And the idea, as I said, was getting researchers to understand more about e-infrastructure and how NRENs should be developing e-infrastructure that could uh, be used to improve collaboration for research and basically make research, scientific research, more discoverable, more open, so that um, beyond researchers just publishing their findings, they'll be able to uh, provide the data and the applications that would allow researchers from other parts of the world to look at the raw data, look at their applications and foster further collaborations or improve on the work that had already been done. Um, so as part of that project, um, we got involved with basically developing infrastructure, uh, actually on behalf of NGREN as it, as it happens, um, we actually started to, uh, we became the certificate CA certification authority, and we started to take baby steps into developing some of the identity provider infrastructure that was required to ensure that we could have secure and seamless collaborations between users and tools and applications. So by the end of 2014, the AI for Africa project ended, and then SciGaia, which is another project, um, funded by the European Union kicked in and basically sort of built upon the AI for Africa um, project with similar goals to continue to develop capacity and infrastructure through science gateways. Um, the idea being that uh, researchers could actually build their applications, do their scientific research and store this information in science gateways so we were starting to learn a whole lot more about uh, repositories. And uh, during the course of the SciGaia project, there were a number of uh, workshops and webinars that were done um, around the, the continent. And um, um, basically just a lot of engagement and awareness was being, being developed. And uh, uh, we ran some. We, we ran numerous workshops uh, with our partners, talking about e infrastructure, how to expose re, uh, your research, and uh, that really ended up in a project and e hack um, um, and a hack fest that we did e research hack fest in collaboration with Wacker, and we hosted that. And um, when we actually engaged in that hack fest. Uh, we got researchers and their IT developers from around the country and uh, some other researchers participated from other parts of Africa in this Hackfest. And what uh, amazed us, I know in previous uh, presentations, there's been the discussion about the lack of uh, research that's being done in the country. But even though more needs to be done in that space, we were quite surprised that the quality of research that was taking place in certain institutions. Um, so some of these researchers came, um, showed their applications, developed a bit more of their, their applications during the Hackfest, and the IT team came with them and they were exposed to the tools that would be used to um, develop the science gateways or e-infrastructure where these research applications and data could be um, hosted. So um, that, that uh, Hackfest really showed that there's a lot of very good research going on in um, our institutions, but it was not visible. Nobody knew about it. The applications were just not, not visible. So by the end of this Hackfest, um, some of these applications were now hosted in cloud infrastructure that existed outside Nigeria and indeed outside West Africa. So one of uh, the organizations that facilitated the Hackfest, um, University of Catania, actually hosted some of these appli Nigerian applications on their servers. Um, 
And I think what that did really, I think it was one of the triggers for Wakren to sort of uh, put out a call uh, to all the NRENs within the West African region to come and collaborate and develop a pilot cloud uh, infrastructure. So um, Echo Connects answered that call and uh, we uh, established a relationship with one of the data center, one of the prominent data center companies in, um, in Lagos, Medallion Communications. So in collaboration with them and with WACREN, we were able to deploy a cluster, server cluster, uh, that effectively was uh, the cloud pipe pilot for the region, for the, for the West African region. Um, obviously that took some time to develop the infrastructure and uh, the platform, but once that was done, we were able to then migrate those e-applications that had been hosted outside Nigeria back into this cloud platform and then other, other shared services that we had some competencies in and a lot of experience in such as library management systems and e-learning systems. These were all hosted on this uh, cloud platform. And some of the prototyping for identity providers that we had been doing in previous years um, hosted really on uh, servers in University of Lagos, we actually migrated them into this um, cloud infrastructure that we we had, and uh, some other services were in their embryonic stages, and they, they, they came on board, like um, uh, Edurom. So we were basically able to provide core Edurom infrastructure for Nigeria and for some of the West African countries. I think. Mali and Togo uh, come to mind. Um, and so this kind of occurred around 2016, uh, 2017, and this coincided with the emergence of Libsense. Um, and I must talk uh, quite a lot about uh, Libsense. I, I recall the first uh, workshop that they did in Abuja in the NUC building. and. Um, that really, um, the emergence of Libsense and the workshops that they did around, uh, around the continent really opened up Echo Connect's eyes actually to the importance of um, open science. And a lot of the advocacy and the training and the toolkits and templates that Libsense provided actually informed us on how we needed to put together and provide service offerings for the uh, research and education community in, in Nigeria. And what Libsense also did for us as well was that it opened us up to a cater of other international experts in the field of, field of open science, open access and librarianship and encouraged us to have closer engagement with our library practitioners and uh, our researchers. So, and, 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 and that is even evidenced today by the the number of librarians that are at this symposium. Yeah. Um, so um, we, as a uh, professor at Atairo kind of uh, referred to, um, we became, you know, Coconut became very strong advocates for everything open and the importance of uh, tracking research outputs and basically how to populate your repositories and make them visible um, and this was all part of looking at, um, you know, repository technologies, how they're to be used, what kind of uh, um, identifier infrastructure would be required. At the time, we were one of the few organizations uh, on the continent that had established relationships with data sites to provide uh, DOIs. And of course, we were continuing to work closely with Libsense and WACREN on some of the identity infrastructure. So we had the catch-all EduID identity provider. We'd been involved in some of that development and we were continuing to do a lot of workshops uh, just to promote that infrastructure and the policies that would surround the use of these infrastructures and technologies. So particularly from 2018 um, forward, 
uh, our user conferences had a very heavy theme of open access, open science, open research. And uh, we situated dedicated days for engagement with librarians, researchers, and ICT um, practitioners just to bring the advocacy and the awareness and uh, these policy discussions about how we could use all of these infrastructures that were being developed to enhance uh, research practice. Um, in fact, in our 2020, uh, in our 2020 conference, um, there was a communique where the, the library community and ICT community agreed that we should even approach uh, other stakeholders such as TED Fund to let them be aware of what we were doing and see how we could collaborate and support the work that TED Fund were doing in terms of developing their own impact uh, analysis systems and they could leverage the work and knowledge that we had in Echo Connect to enhance what uh, TED Fund were already doing with building their systems. So um, all of this kind of uh, activity, capacity building, like we said, some of it was via webinars and workshops. Some of it was actually going to, to campuses to look at uh, practices and infrastructure. So we were working very much with uh, with, I say, like I said, library repository managers, ICT directors, but also on the student level uh, through our ICT for Girls programs and women and WACRAN programs where we're encouraging girls to adopt uh, STEM skills. We were also promoting citizen science uh, um, through those programs. So we had these programs where we were online programs where girls and women could learn Python programming and R programming. And at the end of those uh, courses, they would engage in some hackfest or some project that was citizen science based that involved the use of robots, uh, IoT and uh, Raspberry Pis. But it was all geared towards the promotion of open science, open access, citizen science. And we were always involved and engaged with uh, the work that LibSense was doing. We became very involved with all of the LibSense activities. And uh, we do co-chair the LibSense infrastructure working group. Um, then, of course, as everyone has talked about, come to, uh, beginning of 2020, the, uh, the pandemic kind of uh, hit and lockdown uh, took place. Now, at, uh, and that really just brings me to the second half of my uh, presentation. So by the beginning of uh, 2020, um, I co connect with learned so much, we were doing so much, and uh, we felt that it was a good time for us to wrap up the uh, WACREN pilot crowd, uh, cloud that we had, we, we had had, and basically develop our own infrastructure to focus directly on, on the Nigerian r &E community. Um, and of course, because of everything we'd learned, information from surveys, interaction with, with the library practitioners, there were clearly areas that we knew we wanted to address from an infrastructure perspective. One of the things we, we, oh, we came across quite frequently uh, when talking to librarians was the this idea of their dependency on the the ICT team to deliver some of the infrastructure and library uh, uh, applications that were needed, and there seems to have been a bit more, an identity crisis as to whether li librarians were actually ICT people or whether the ICT people were librarians. So um, we hoped to also help that uh, situation by making available cloud-based resources that library and other cadres of, um, of researchers and academics could use in the cloud. And uh, as this, cloud, uh, this slide um, is presenting, the areas we wanted to focus on were obviously uh, federated identity and access management because we know that trust and identity forms the, 
the bedrock of uh, open science and open research. So in order to have researchers collaborate with themselves and use different tools and platforms, they really must know, uh, they must know who they are, we must be able to identify uh, who these users are for security reasons. And then uh, there were issues about journal uh, publications and uh, research data management and use of repositories. So it effectively uh, a co-connect uh, based on all the discussions and what we'd heard from the uh, community in 2020, we developed this open science community cloud um, that has got some core um, services within, within the platform um, as, as shown on this, uh, this slide. And I'll just talk very briefly about um, some of them, but the whole idea is that um, uh, the community can basically come to this platform uh, in a secure in a secure way using federated identity um, or EduID to access some of these um, services. And I'll speak to each of them individually. So of course the um, um, EduID is one of the key services, um, like uh, the like co-connect with the actual operators of the Nigerian Identity Federation. And uh, we're on the verge of being part of uh, EduGain. Um, EduGain is actually the global uh, identity federation for the RNE community. Um, so we'll, we expect uh, before the end of uh, this month, we will be part of EduGain as well. And uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, the Identity Federation, it's just work we've been doing from, for many years, was to have this identity and access management infrastructure so that researchers can come and use these uh, tools and be able to assign academic identity to their users so they can securely use the services that are available. Um, one of the key applications that leverages uh, the identity infrastructure is Edurom. Um, and Edurom, for those of you who are not so familiar with Edurom, it's a, it's a, tool, a tool that enables Wi-Fi roaming so that um, because you're a member of uh, an identity federation, you researchers and students could go to any institution locally or abroad and have seamless access to Wi-Fi in any of the institutions that support uh, Eduron. So it was a great, Eduron was a great enabler of researcher and student mobility and increasing collaboration just because that uh, that service is there for the research and education community. Um, and as you can see from this slide, we've been working with uh, a number of institutions uh, to for them to basically use um, Edurome and become part of the Nigerian Identity Federation. And we encourage all the participants who are here from the different institutions to also uh, subscribe to the Nigerian Identity Federation so you can get access to humor, numerous resources and platforms that will be very impactful in your um, research practice and education practice. Um, one of the other uh, tools that we have within the uh, open science cloud infrastructure is um, video conferencing. Many, many of you are already uh, familiar with Zoom, but there are also open source alternatives. Um, the value add that we bring as an end uh, to this is the ability to actually have video servers or connectors hosted within our platform locally. Um, what that basically means is that when you're using some of these uh, communication tools, uh, because we're keeping the video and audio processing local and the traffic local, you have a better quality of um, experience when doing the uh, video uh, conferencing. So when, it, when you start to look at having really large webinars with hundreds or 
hundreds of people or big lectures with hundreds of students, then you'll find that using these connectors would be a whole lot more efficient and uh, the quality of your video calls will, will not be degraded. And of course, uh, what we also offer is integration of these uh, communication services with your workflows and your learning environments. So that's a bit, uh, basically a key tool that we, we have. And then we're working uh, with a number of open source platforms to provide scholarly communication and collaboration in the areas of uh, shared research data management, shared uh, national repositories. And uh, we're working, we're part of the development team uh, that uses uh, Invenio, and that's led by the uh, European CERN. I think CERN stands for the European Nuclear Research uh, Organization. I got that right, let me just check that. Yeah, European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. Uh, they're leading the development of uh, research data management platforms, leveraging uh, Invenio. So we're part of the uh, part of that team, and we're in the process of deploying uh, that platform. And we hopefully will have interface interfaces that different caters of the RNA community can use uh, for harvesting, for populating uh, their repositories with data artifacts, and basically just getting fully involved with research data management. Um, and also we're working, as Omar alluded to in uh, his presentation, we have a partnership with uh, Coco Foundation um, to deploy and work with them on um, an open source based uh, publishing platform called Kotahi. Um, the idea with Kotahi is that um, institutions are able to use the shared platform to publish their journals or e-prints or other artifacts um, in a cost-effective manner because we know that uh, publishing, publishing tends to be expensive and uh, working with Kotahi and using some of the um, persistent identifiers that we have, DOIs and obviously EDUID, um, being able to publish these things in uh, the Kotahi platform will also allow you to have the visibility that is required for, for your publications. Um, oh, we're eating into the Q&A time already. Okay, okay, I'm about to round up. Um, so and then alongside all of this infrastructure, we are uh, working with uh, LibSense on some of the capacity building initiatives for open science practice. Uh, I think uh, Omar talked about the uh, early career research training for postgraduates and postdoctorates in campuses so that we can build these open science communities of, of practice and uh, curricular and leadership programs. Uh, E-learning, uh, we've, we've talked about, um, I've already talked about, we've basically been offering Moodle, we deployed Moodle for universities from 2004. Um, we also um, supported uh, the People's Uni, uh, which was a Moodle platform that was used to provide masters in public health. So we provided the user and admin uh, support for that platform up until 2021. And uh, Echo Connect ourselves, we actually use our platforms for our women in WACREN programs and ICT girls, um, ICT for girls programs to develop capacity in STEM for women and <clears throat> develop uh, citizen science pro projects using robots and uh, Raspberry Pis. Um, so on the consultancy level, we have international partnerships as well. Obviously working with LibSense has been very uh, uh, crucial to, to the work that we do. Um, we're also in partnership with the likes of JISC. Uh, JISC is the UK NREN, and I, I think um, that they'll actually be um, giving a presentation tomorrow. 
And uh, the work we're currently doing with JISC is part of a British council funded project called Digital University Africa, where we're trying to identify the skills gaps and um, look at digital literacy skills that need to be developed to ensure that our lecturers, our researchers, and our students can actually engage in the digital transformation that's required to be able to use all of these digital tools and digital practices moving forward, particularly in light of COVID-19. Um, so to summarize all of that, um, I've, we've heard so much from uh, the other presenters, but uh, EcoConnect realizes that as an NREN or a REN, it is critical uh, for us to support open science by providing these cloud-based shared infrastructure services that adhere to, to global standards. We want to work with the likes of TED Fund in the work that they're doing for their own reporting infrastructure to ensure that they have all the infrastructure that is required around their, their systems to be interoperable with other global partners so that TED Fund themselves can look at ways of collaborating with other um, funders so that um, there is kind of more, more funding that comes in with TED Fund and TED Fund in partnership with other international um, organizations. Um, but and primarily, one of the reasons why CoConnect convened uh, this symposium as part of the whole open roadmap strategy that Libsense initiated, we do want to bring all the stakeholders together and look at all the different work that's being done and see how we can all collaborate together to move forward with an effective open science engagement. So obviously, we're very interested uh, in what uh, the TED Fund uh, bill that uh, wants to be put forward. And we really believe that um, open science and open research should be embedded in that bill. Um, so I think uh, that sort of ends my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Owen, for that uh, insightful presentation. Uh, we're a bit uh, low on time, but since this event continues tomorrow, uh, I believe uh, people can still send in their questions and uh, they'll be answered even maybe at some point later. Uh, we have 10 questions in the Q&A. Some of them have been answered already. I see like five of them answered already. Uh, so just go straight to the ones we have here and uh, let any of the panelists feel free to, to field any of the questions. We have one from Samuel Olawu uh, says, how do we eliminate the distraction from security challenges in the implementation process of collaborative research? for higher education in Nigeria. Destruction of security challenges. Mm. Who would like to take that among the panelists? Yes, as good as mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most likely myself. Because okay. they're funding tertiary institutions anyway. Is that all right? Could, who's speaking, please? Who's speaking? Uh, Mr. That's Professor Gogoro. Uh, that Professor Gogoro. Yes, yes. Okay. It's showing us most of our Bukola. Prof, can, can you repeat no, that, please? No problem. No, no problem. He's my clone. <laughs> my <own>. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, let me, I, I will respond. But if, if, if we... If I chicken out at some point, I mean, for any reason, if I'm unable to cope with time and I have to write because I say I'm on the medicals here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's on that's Yeah, let me respond quickly to that uh, issue. Well, the issue of security, we can only do as much hmm. to respond to the challenges. We, we know that it is it's done in our country today, we are passing through the worst of moments in terms of internal uh, insecurity. It's very unfortunate, it shouldn't be, but we found ourselves. Uh, at some point, kidnappings, um, it was either 
those that have money or politicians or outright vendetta uh, operations, as it were. But more recently, nobody is fair. A number of lecturers have been kidnapped. Mm. And uh, it, there's a wider concern about the impact of insecurity on our operations. But talking about insecurity in respect of research, oh, indeed, well, we know that once we give out funds for research, the research engagements cut across this country. And uh, so we, we have instances where, uh, well, the, the National Research Fund, for instance, uh, monitors, goes out physically to verify ongoing research uh, projects. And uh, it is very sad that there have been cancellations and rescheduling of a number of uh, monitoring visits because of the sad situation of insecurity. Well, we know that it's virtually, it's affected virtually everything from the economy to farming to almost every other thing. So um, there isn't much we can do. Let's just hope and pray that we get over this. <laughs> to me, that is the much that I can say in respect of the direct this thing. Otherwise, we know that insecurity is affected so many things. Uh, more recently, it is competing with uh, dis distracting tertiary educational system, competing with COVID-19. Mm. It's, it's very unfortunate. We hope it does not last much longer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, answer. Uh, what I just want to chip in very, very uh, shortly that uh, what if we look at it this way? What if we take security away from the zone of destruction to that zone of uh, challenge, turn it into a research challenge? Uh, maybe we can make headway there. Well, what are the things we can do in terms of hope on research to help alleviate the security challenges that we have? That's well, it. I, I, I can answer you quickly because I only last night, by chance, okay. myself and the executive secretary of NUC are all in London. Okay. We were discussing, we were discussing last night with him, and um, I told him that of the mega research grants that I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, um, we identified what I call priority areas for the mega research grant that I said would range definitely far higher than the 50 million for NRF. We are talking mm. of up to, up to 250 million or even 300 million for some cases. Mm. And I can tell you here that, for instance, we have, uh, we have gone far, we are hoping to support uh, a mega research grant in the area of production of production of vaccine. Okay. Yeah, uh, we want to resuscitate the National Veterinary Research Institute vaccine uh, production line, and uh, they are working in partnership. They are forged a partnership with Naimer Yaba Lagos National Institute for Medical Research. Uh, with That's the good. DG Professor Salako there and the uh, University, Usman Danfodio University, Sokoto, who have some very credible ongoing research on the, uh, I, um, well, in, in respect of COVID. In fact, uh, the, the mm -hmm. Vice Chancellor told me very clearly they are proceeding to work mm -hmm. on a candidate uh, vaccine at the UD Sokoto. Mm -hmm. And we have the Veterinary Faculty of University of Jos as well as the Chemical Research Institute, Zaria, uh, all converging at the National Veterinary Research Institute, BOM. Um, we, we've gone far trying to pull them together uh, to respond to the, the, the challenge. But suddenly I realized that uh, we have a, a team of some top uh, scholars that have put up a proposal on the security challenge uh, in the context of, well, specifically security, but also looking at the larger picture of those aspects that have antecedents 
from the mm. national, uh, what do you call it, discourse and the unfortunate situation of uh, the threat to national unity. And I think we are ready to put some money. Uh, I think one, two or three of former presidents of, of uh, one of the uh, membership of the Academy of Letters, they are working on that. And only last night, I also thought we agreed with the ES of NUC that uh, some former leaders of the Academy of Letters may have ideas around some of the issues of governance and whatever. So let me assure you that we are looking at, we already have proposal, even in the recent one that we approved, one or two of the research grant that we approved uh, just about, but we, I signed the letter last week. It includes the issue of national unity, the issue of insecurity, Very good. Uh, integration and all that. Very so, good. Um, I, I can I can assure you that we are looking at the larger picture. Thank you, thank you for that assurance. Uh, we have the next question here: Industry or private partnership research in our universities seems not to be encouraged because of funding restrictions. How can we make the private sector to be more interested in sponsoring research that will enhance their industries? Thank you very much. I can. I don't think I need to struggle too much in this regard. One, the Ted Fund RDSC, Research and Development Standing Committee. If you take a look at the membership of that committee, believe me, it's the first time in our country at that top level that we've aggregated up to 164 persons and uh, with, 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 with about nearly 30% of that, 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 that team. Yes, nearly 30%, or even a little above 30%, are made up of not just uh, academia, but essentially industry, heads of the key research institutes in Nigeria, cutting across the disciplines, from science and technology ministry, to environment ministry, to defense, to uh, uh, agriculture, et cetera. They are all there. So in fact, that, remember, like Dr. Ayo Mustafa mentioned earlier, um, the, we have the Dangotes, the Innocent Motors, the Seplats, and uh, some of the oil operators, et cetera, et cetera. They are all in it. FinTech Africa uh, chairman, uh, Dr. Shogun Aina, is not only in the RDSC, he is also in the Executive Draft Bill Committee. So I can assure you that we have responded. But let me be more specific that Tefan, beyond the RDSC, we've demonstrated forging partnership between academia and industry, when two years ago, for the first time, I made a case to the Board of Trustees of Ted Fund that our research grant, private uh, universities or polytechnics, research institutes, and the industry can benefit, but as second level research partners, not as, uh, 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 what do you call it, principal investigators or, or principal researchers. Uh, but a second level. In other words, those that are beneficial institutions so that we do not break the law of Ted Fund. Um, the, 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 the private universities, in fact, I can tell you outright that Landmark, I think um, uh, Covenant and other private universities have already won Ted Fund research grants. A number of research right. institutes are holding Ted Fund research grant right now as I'm talking. In other words, we've actually gone far in inviting industry to partner with academia. That's my response there. Thank you, thank you, yes, uh, I can, uh, I am a witness to the things you have just shared now. That question was from Christopher Hola. The next question is from Fumilaya Oluyede. Prof. Bogoro, this for you again. We are yet okay. to have this year's research fundings advertised, including that one of mega research you talked about. When should we expect the call, sir? Thank you very much. The call will cover only the ones that we traditionally uh, put across. And uh, I can assure you what has been holding it is the reconstitution of the two major committees that we know in Ted Fund, the National Research Fund and the Technical Advisory Group. Uh, these are the two uh, flying committees that most academia know about in Ted Fund. The NRF, as we call it for short, National Research Fund, the one that manages the research grants of up to 50 million per grant. Uh, that is the one I've been talking more about. But that, like I said, from this year, uh, taking a lesson from the challenge of COVID, 
Last year, Ted Fund had to go a supporting research grant outside our beneficiary institution, including NAFDA, because it was a national necessity. And so we had to do that. Now, about uh, we, 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 we are in the next few weeks, I, I don't think it should take more than two, three weeks, at most four weeks from now. The new, the reconstituted committee of NRF and TAC will come into being. It is that committee that will proceed to put up on behalf of Ted Fund the, 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 the guidelines. Although hardly anything has changed uh, as far as I know. So the, 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 there will be a, the call for concept note any moment. But the good news is that only a few days ago, I signed the letters of the 217 uh, recently approved research grant like Dr. Ayo Kupola mentioned earlier. So um, we are virtually there and um, it's just the mega research grant that we, we will not advertise that one. We are taking advantage of what we understand as the priority issues <clears throat> in the country. And I can quickly name for you the areas, about like four the, areas, oh. yes, that they are about to cover. There is, I mentioned that of uh, resuscitation of vaccine production uh, machinery at the National Veterinary Research Institute, VOM. Now, if, if, if remember I mentioned the partners that are coming into that mega research. I named them specifically. The other one is on phytodrug production led by the National Institute for Pharmaceutical Research and Development, IDU, Abuja. Uh, that is, as you will appreciate, uh, our capacity to produce drugs has gone down so embarrassingly low. We cannot allow that to continue much longer. The other one is on defense and security. We intend to put money at the DICON in Kaduna. Uh, you know that that is uh, an institution that has done made some commendable breakthroughs, innovative breakthroughs in military hardware, including uh, the armored vehicle produced by uh, Major General, um, what, what do you call this guy, that was the Director General until, until recently. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, Izegu, that's right. I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you know that. And uh, the other one is we, we, we want to, I, I mentioned earlier that we have, we have invited some grant uh, writing from, for, for the purpose of addressing insecurity and promotion of uh, national unity and all that and all that. That is another one. Then there is one on agriculture. Specifically, we, are, we, have, we have initiated a, a mega research uh, trust focusing on dairy research and development. This is a major embarrassing area with all that. There has been so much diverse, attention being diverted to uh, harder and sedentary farmers clashes. And uh, some of us say, look, we are the professionals. Uh, let the politicians do their thing at their own end. The professional, let's get it right. And we want to strengthen the mechanism for ensuring that there is more productive uh, rearing of animals under well catered confinement, as you know, it, it cannot be otherwise. So the professionals, mm -hmm. we have to demonstrate that uh, uh, with a research and development center on dairy, I think uh, those are about the areas. Then the Academy of Letters, we, I believe they, they, they have the leverage to pick an area that is appropriate for national development. It may be leadership, it may be whatever. Uh, so these are some of our thoughts I want to share with you. Thank you again, Prof. Bogoro. Uh, there's another one. Uh, let me check here with uh, Owen. We are obviously going to not meet your time speculation of one hour. How many more questions can we take of our one o'clock, right? Well, um, I think I just sent something to you in the private chat for you to, to look okay. at. Um, uh, that. But uh, I would indulge um, the, the attendees that are still here, if we can still spend about another 15 minutes or uh, about 15 minutes to take yeah. uh, questions and discussions to the theme of the Symposium. Exactly. By the way, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, um, I just realized there's something that I, I just addressed those quick questions, but there is something from the beginning that I expected uh, it will help everybody if I shed some light on it. 
Um, I, I, I listen to the yeah, I listen to the presentation by others, and um, let me provide this information that at Ted Fund, by the way, only recently at the last board of trustees, we reviewed the priority areas we'll be funding our scholars for PhDs. Uh, I mean, overseas. And we realized that we couldn't be sponsoring people to go and read what we call boring and idle courses. Uh, we've decided to uh, prioritize going forward. I can assure you that 90 to 95% of the courses will be mainly in the sciences. That is, that is the area and that is the current trend globally. We cannot be otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. let, me, let me make this joke. You know, at the Board of Trustees, it was said, somebody put it, a board member put it and said, what justification do we have to sponsor somebody to go and read personnel management with a PhD? And that person spends 80 something million out of 150 million made available for a single institution. It's unfair in a year. So we are reprioritizing and uh, very soon you see, we'll publish the areas that are mainly in the sciences, both the basic and applied sciences. Um, let, me also, let me also add this. In the spirit of EcoConnect, uh, REN, we have Ted Fund, the Board of Trustees approved, and uh, we are inventorizing thesis, previous thesis in our universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education. And um, we started with the postgraduate thesis, of course, deliberately emphasizing the PhDs. Uh, we are inventorizing them. In other words, uh, dematerializing them to electronic versions. Uh, we, we feel this is very important and that would help your platform. And um, I, I can assure you, it does appear in less than nine months from now, we are likely to have this first set of uh, institutions that are have properly covered and we'll have a repository for thesis. Uh, you and me can go back uh, in the past, it was like if hard copy of a thesis was missing, uh, you, you, you just wonder where you get it. But with the inventorization, electronic inventorization of thesis, it makes it easy. And for me at that fund, the whole of one key thing that I get from the engagement today is the issue of visibility. That's why we're talking about journals, talking about libraries. And the modern library, yes, there is a hard book uh, section but that the virtual section of libraries are actually more relevant in the context of reality now. So we're not missing that. I can assure you, we have gone far very soon. Uh, those that finish their PhD, TC, masters, um, 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years back in Nigeria institutions will have their inventorized and they can access them with, it, with the soft touch of a button. I just felt I should share this with you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, can we, uh, Omar, ask your question since you can type it up? Well, I did type it up, and it's again for Professor Bogoro. Sorry, Professor Bogoro. Um, no problem. My, my question was uh, quite sim very simple. You know, I think you sort of partly addressed it in your last response, and 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 it's, I'm I'm speaking to the theme of the of the symposium which is towards an open science action plan. And my question were, in your view, what do you think are the next steps we should take towards that kind of uh, action plan for Nigeria? I'm asking because when we have these lip sense meetings in every country, the, uh, the output or the outcome is to work towards some activity where we can provide support to make, to, to create an action, or at least provide input into a national plan that allows the, the make sure the plan is interoperable um, regionally and internationally and is globally aligned. And there's okay. certain elements that are quite technical that are, I mean, in terms of the, um, the open mm -hmm. research space, that these are new paradigms that are not so popular. So we are keen to make sure each country that is discussing these activities are also aligned internationally. So what, what would be the next step for Nigeria? Well, let me first give you a privilege of information. Uh, the Board of Trustees of Ted Fund in, in consultation with the Honorable Minister who subsequently uh, convinced Mr. President that Ted Fund has offered and uh, we in, injected it into the 2021 budget of Ted Fund 
Mr. President has approved, and I announced it when I, 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 I presented the letters of allocation to the beneficiary institutions that the derelict infrastructure called the National Library in Abuja that has been there for, for over 15 years, in fact, perhaps about 20 years now since it was started, that Ted Fund has decided that as an incidental to one of its mandates under its law, we have the discretion to proceed and complete that project. And so to me, that demonstrates our faith in inventorization. And as you know it, with the emphasis on uh, the electronic components, the virtual components of libraries, I think our priority is right. We are looking forward to whatever we can do from the end of that fund. I mean, if there is any segment in the vertical uh, subsections of the education sector that need libraries and to support research and knowledge overall, uh, communication of knowledge. It is uh, the tertiary institutions. And so, and that is the segment, the, the tertiary subsector that we are funding. And we've met that. Secondly, I am happy to inform you that when I, only last week, we had a meeting of librarians of Nigerian universities at the National Universities Commission, just a few days ago. And uh, they invited me as a chairman of the occasion. And uh, I made remarks. And in, in my remarks, I was happy to inform them. Uh, they had earlier paid a visit to me and made a case. They made a case that when we give money for library intervention, that many of the heads of institutions proceed to just buy, in short, the money is just turned into procurements. And uh, in many cases, yeah. the procurements are not even relevant for libraries. And uh, I told them, I said, I will query my monitoring and evaluation department if they do not establish these facts. And that going forward, no head of institution, whether you are vice chancellor, rector, or provost, you cannot spend our money on library intervention without requesting input of the librarian. And believe me, the librarians are very happy with my position. And I briefed the board of trustees about it, and they are completely agreeable. We are taking the issue of inventorization library, virtual knowledge communication, very serious. And uh, it is in this regard that we hope that uh, we will continue to do whatever is required. We have partnerships. We have partnerships at multiple levels. We have uh, MOUs we have signed with different organizations. By the way, let me take advantage to mention this, that Ted Fund only recently was uh, admitted in Nigeria as the first uh, and the Commonwealth Science Granting Council, the very first institution in Nigeria to be admitted uh, as a member of that council. And what that translates to is that Tedfan has been recognized as a credible research grant manager. And so we now will be, subsequently, we will be given funds from the Commonwealth Science Council to administer in Nigeria. I think. It is in recognition of our, I mean, the credibility of our research grant management process. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, information. We still have some questions here. It's like the questions keep growing. Uh, the more we get information, the more questions we have. And uh, quite a number of them are going for Prof. Uh, Bogoro. From, uh, this one is from Abubakar Muhammad. So my question to Prof. Bogoro, what is your organization doing in terms of funding in order to improve teaching, research, and staff training in technical vocational education in universities? This is because in these institutions, facilities and standard workshops are lacking. Wow. Thank you very much. I know that uh, it, it, it didn't have to be more specific to mention, if we talk of TV, it's largely the polytechnics. But mm -hmm. then we have universities of science and tech, and they, are, they have uh, you know, similar uh, mandate and uh, focus. Uh, let me announce this, by the way, that for the first time in the 2021 budget, I announced it last week. Uh, it has been approved that we will have, just like we had 12 centers of excellence 
largely around first and second generation universities last year. This year we'll have another 12 and it will be six polytechnics, six federal polytechnics, six federal colleges of education. And in the polytechnics, the focus uh, of those centers of excellence will be on skills development. And uh, we, we want to continue to be relevant. And by the way, talking about TVET, um, there is there the engineering facilities that were made available to universities and polytechnics. In fact, the polytechnic were the first to have gotten from, uh, there is this Israeli uh, technology providers, uh, Skill G. It was all around simulation equipment for engineering. And you know that simulation equipment are some of the latest of infrastructure in respect of uh, engineering and technology. So um, whatever we need to do, because in the board of, of TED Fund, the three key regulators in the tertiary subsector, that is uh, for universities, NUC, for polytechnics, NBTE, for College of Education, NCCE, they are all members of the board of trustees of TED Fund. And as much as possible, we are guided by their advice and wisdom, as well as experience, so that we do it right. We may have the money, but we listen to them to guide us. Uh, I can assure um, uh, the person that put across the question that um, we, we don't mind even personal communication in case he has more specific issues he wants to raise with me. Believe me, you can send it to me in my office as ES of that fund, or even send it to me as Suleiman Bogoro. I will respond. Thank you very much. The next question is from Patrick. I would, like to, I would have liked to interject, uh, Professor Tayero. Um, Please go ahead. Yeah, obviously, because the, we have the, the presence of the distinguished gentleman, so many questions are being directed uh, towards him because one might not get the opportunity to ask him again. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Professor Bogoro, who's an Owen from Echo Connect. Um, it's kind of a follow on from what um, Omar asked as well. Um, you've gone into a lot of detail about some of the specifics. And when listening to uh, Dr. Popola's presentation about uh, uh, the establishment of the NRDF and the goals of the um, RDSC, uh, I wanted to ask Professor Bogoro, is there a way when we're talking about open science and open research and we're trying to look at policy that could um, uh, guide th that whole practice? Um, what are your, your, your thoughts, if any, on how uh, the different stakeholders like we as NREM providers, librarians and TED Fund could cohese around a open science policy that all sort of informed and dictated how open research practice would, would uh, take place moving forward. Did Prof get that? Look like he's he got that. Look, it looks like he might have a he might have a um, connection have a connection yeah. problem. I was and I can see that we have clocked our other deadline again. So mm -hmm. I'm sure a whole lot of people want to go. I still see exactly. a lot of people, which is really impressive. But I yeah. uh, I have to be leaving soon as well. Can I make so, a maybe, suggestion, maybe, uh, Professor maybe this one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know. Um, I am glad that you know Prof, Professor Bogoro has just described how TED Fund is being very forward and innovative. Hello. Oh, you're back, Prof. Hello. We can hear you. Yes, Prof. Prof. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've had interference as a result of some uh call coming in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Did you get the last question from I, yeah? I, I missed I missed the concluding part of his uh question. Well, um, the, the, the summary of my question, Prof, was how um, all the stakeholders from the likes of ourselves as NREM providers, the research and education community, and 
uh, TED Fund and other stakeholders that we may not be aware of can coalesce around a, an agreed policy that uh, drives um, open research and open science. Yeah. Uh, well, let me say this, that um, the other day I discussed, by the way, let me... Prof, we can barely hear you. I, I can't, I'm not can't, hearing anything. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. He, he gave you a lot of information about what uh, RDSC and NRDF uh, are doing at the moment. Yes. Yes. Oh, maybe I should ask an outright question, Professor Boguru. Um, that visibility is enhanced. Hello? Hello, Prof. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I, I have you? You're hearing me? Well, yes, where well, it's coming in and out. But I, I, I wanted to make it a bit simpler and ask a direct question to you. Good. In our, in our, in our Lipsense experience, we have yeah. seen, you know, and I'm taking up the question that Owen brought up. We have seen that uh, you do need to have all the stakeholders in the room, um, especially those that have the practical experience of open research, open science, and the infrastructural and policy requirements in a room looking at a local context and then articulating an open science action plan. Now, Owen mentioned the open science, national open science no, policy. Sorry, Prof. Okay. So I was, just conclude, just conclude okay. your question. So I'm asking you, because I can see that TED Fund is, I mean, you can see the questions. TED Fund is, uh, is a primary driver here. What can okay. TED Fund do to bring these elements together so that, you know, even from the outside, we can provide input uh, that allows you to develop a national open science policy? Yeah, first, let me, I, 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 there is a, the, the aspect that uh, I, I, I never commented about, but you know that uh, we, Ted Fund originally was the main direct funder of NG REN until, until we discovered that the, 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 the protocols associated with it, we could not sustain the funding. So we had to decentralize. Uh, but um, we are very happy to know that um, the, the, the various platforms that are, are in partnership with uh, Echo Connect um, have relationship with NGRN and of course at the in, uh, individual institutional level. Uh, that is very important for, for all of us. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate that. Um, let me say this. When Dr. Ayo Pupola told me um, last week that it's been observed that um, TED Fund research activities are not very visible. I, I got worried and I said, I don't know what mechanism of visibility um, is required that we are not out there seeing. Because today I want to say this, that the TED Fund research grant has gone through first stage and perhaps I moved to second stage as a vaccine candidate. I wonder how this could be missed out in the context of visibility. And uh, TED Fund is supporting journals. Publication in respect of both TED Fund funded grants as well as institution-based grants, in that of IBR also, institution-based research ongoing, and any others as, as it were as funded by TED Fund. Uh, they are being published in those various journals and we know uh, they are, they are, a number of them are, are already indexed journals. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have to look at the wider picture of um, how we ensure, because in fact, we're looking beyond just the visibility. For us at Ted Fund, we are looking at the impact, the impact of the research grants that we have supported over the years. Today, We are saying we are supported over 1,000. We we have already we have commissioned uh, the 
um, emergence of a software that will assess us, assist us rather to assess visibility as impact, impact of uh, the journal, uh, I mean, uh, research outcomes that are supported by tech fund. And I think we are hoping that that will help us be able to, because this question comes almost every now and then, even when I engage the media, they would always ask me, uh, sir, what is the level of impact of TED Fund grant, uh, you know, as supported over the years? And uh, I, we, are, we are very conscious about this and we, we have gone far. Very soon we have, we are going to approve that software that will assist us to be able to know uh, which are the outcomes of uh, third fund supported research grants that are impactful at institutional level, at community level, national and uh, international level, or in science community, in security sub subsector, in medicine, et cetera, et cetera. I just felt I should add this, but any other areas at the end of this two day meeting, um, I will remain with you because I, I said, uh, because of the nature of my commitments, I, 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 cannot, uh, I cannot be with you. I'm sure that tomorrow I cannot hook up with you because the purpose that I came here, I have to face it. Whatever are there, some yeah. other issues, I will be glad if I get communication from you people in areas that uh, will, be, will be very happy to respond to going forward. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, at this point, uh, I don't know if uh, Owen agrees with me. We just have to wrap it up because quite a number of people are disengaging already. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we just have I to wrap it up. We'll so have to try. We have missed yeah. yeah. all the questions that we yeah. still have. We can send them to the panelists, let them respond to them. And uh, the organizers will find a way of getting back to. to yes, the, we, will, we will harvest the questions and then. Um, if there is time um, tomorrow in the, the, the day two, we will try to um, also address some of the outstanding uh, questions that we have. Yes, sir. The, the, the call to action. So yes, I, I think on 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 this note, um, I want to first of all thank um, the executive secretary of TED Fund for not only being here but actually staying throughout the course of. Uh, day one of the symposium, it is much appreciated, sir. Um, thank you. I, want to thank, um, I want to thank all the panelists for their time and effort for the, the presentations that they've made. Um, thank you also, uh, Professor Tyro, for moderating uh, today's um, symposium. And obviously to all the attendees, uh, very impressed with the turnout and the staying power that you all had today. And I encourage you all to join us tomorrow at the same time, uh, where we'll continue with uh, some more in-depth uh, discussions and presentations from uh, other, other speakers that we have for the symposium. So uh, once again, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a good day um, moving forward. I look forward to seeing all of you um, tomorrow, same time tomorrow.